Good morning, everyone. For those of you who weren't here last night, I'm Father Thomas Bayman, the Vice Rector for Academic Affairs at the University of St. Mary the Lake. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second phase of uh, this year's Albert Cardinal Meyer Lecture Series. Uh, this morning, uh, Professor Helen Alvarez will deliver the second of her uh, two addresses. If you were not able to be here last night and missed the first, I'm very happy to tell you that uh, it was uh, live streamed and recorded, and so you can find it on the USML website or on our Facebook page, so you can uh, later on catch up with uh, uh, her presentation from last night. Uh, this morning will also be uh, live streamed and recorded, uh, and so uh, we have a larger audience than is just contained within this auditorium. Uh, how the morning is going to work is Dr. Alvare will uh, deliver her second lecture. Um, that's the first event of the morning. Then after that, there will be two faculty responses. Uh, and uh, at the conclusion of the faculty responses, we'll uh, assemble as a panel. The faculty will have the chance to uh, ask questions of each other in the beginning. And then we will open the conversation to, uh, to the uh, auditorium here. Um, and as I'll mention again there, when we get to that point, uh, there will be uh, assistance with microphones coming around so that those who are participating not in this room are able to hear uh, all of the questions and the discussion. So uh, in the course of the, um, uh, the dialogue afterwards, please only speak uh, with a microphone. Uh, it's my pleasure to once again uh, introduce Helen Alvarez, who is Professor of Law at the Antonin Scalia Law School of George Mason University, where she teaches family law, law and religion, and property law. She publishes mainly in the areas concerning marriage, parenting, non-marital households, and the First Amendment religion clauses. She currently is a consultant for the Pontifical Council for the Laity uh, and uh, also an advisor to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Without further ado, please welcome again Professor Helen Alvarez. Good evening. In the almost bright light of day <laughs> here in, in nice cloudy area. Uh, thank you for coming back. Um, this morning I decided to wade into more of my distinctly legal wheelhouse. Um, one thing I'll say is unlike how I practice with my students, with you I'm going to give away the game in advance <laughs> and then take you through the talk because it is rather legal, but if I tell you what it's doing, then you will have an easier time managing it. Um, uh, additionally, um, uh, I, I will just frame it in ways that are, I think, common language versus legal gobbledygook. Uh, what I'm really going to be talking about today is these situations, and you have lots of them, not only in the diocese here, but around the country, where Catholic institutions are challenged by a mandate or by a non-discrimination law regarding um, an activity they have to undertake, you have to ensure for contraception or abortion, you have to perform a transgender surgery, or um, a situation in which they are told um, who they can hire and fire, um, usually on the grounds of uh, some sexual expression uh, rights or interests that's being articulated by the would-be employee. What I'm going to be talking about today is the fact that the church's response on this, I think, has fallen prey to what I'm calling moralism, just a statement of the rules and what we can and cannot do, what we are and are not permitted to do, and that I think, in line with our own ecclesiology, our own self-understanding as religious institutions in the whole sense, and for the sake of actually advancing religious freedom, People who listen to our words feel judged, they feel that their dignity has been attacked, and they're going to fight back in ways that are going to reduce the free exercise of religion. So moralism is hurting us in our self-understanding, and it's reducing the, uh, I think, the scope of religious freedom over the long run. 
So that's, I just told you what it's about, which I would never do for my law students. And I would make them guess until the very end, maybe until the exam, uh, when the light bulb theoretically goes on, like two days before. Uh, and, and that's going to be my theme. So that will actually begin um, the, the, the roadmap of it. So there's a recent and persistent pattern today in Catholic institutions as employers, as providers of services. Which pattern uh, may win cases in the short run, the way the church is pleading in those cases. But I think in the long run, it's weakening the national stomach for the free exercise of religion in the US. And at the same time, weakening Catholic institutions realizing their own religious missions. It also often allows courts to say de jour, that is as a matter of law, that they're striking the right balance um, with religious institutions' ability to manifest and transmit the faith with other civil law concerns. But de facto, they're not really doing so. This is the pattern I'm referring to. The state will apply to a religious institution an employment non-discrimination law, or a law mandating that the institution provide or cooperate with a specific thing, a contraception mandate, a transgender surgery, sterilization, etc. The institute replies, excuse me, the institution replies with a free exercise uh, response, I can't do as you order, my religion forbids it. That would be immoral. Therefore, we would be burdened. So we're burdened because you're coercing us to do something immoral, and if we don't, we would be either fined or suffer some other legal penalty. Or it asserts that as a religious employer under civil rights acts, it has a specific exemption from certain employment laws. They cannot be forced to employ someone who has done something forbidden by the religion of the institution, they'll say. Or it will say to the government, this is the, the, the coup de grace, where the government can't look behind their statement at all except to affirm that they're telling the truth about it being a ministerial position. They'll say, the position at issue is ministerial. You can't even ask the question, are we discriminating on any basis? Because to do otherwise would be to, inter would be to, to interfere with our deciding who's a minister for purposes of our religion. The focus, in other words, in the institution's response uh, is on the rules of religion. And because the culture around us is obsessed with sexual expression right now, despite the vast majority of church teaching not dealing with these issues, we are constantly being called upon to state what the rules are regarding sexual expression in the United States. Okay? It has not always been this way. Prior free exercise cases going back, you know, 1980s and beyond, they dealt with mostly other things. But because the culture is so obsessed with sexual expression right now as perhaps the fundamental right, uh, going to the very core of the person's mind and deciding what sex they want to be and express, the church is having to deal with these in, in a great number. Now, given the shape of free exercise law today, whether under the Constitution's First Amendment or under something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is a federal statute that provides more free expression than even the Constitution. When a Catholic institution launches these kinds of objections, it has already traveled a good distance towards winning. Okay? In other words, the institution has demonstrated that the government has burdened its sincere religious belief. This is the first prong of a free exercise claim. There's a law. The religious institution claims it burdens them. <clears throat> uh, depending on um, the nature of the law, the, the uh, state may very well have to say, well, I know it burdens your religion, but we have a compelling state interest for doing so. And therefore, you have to suffer the burden. If the state can't show a compelling state interest, exercised by means least restrictive of the religious institution's religious freedom, then the state loses and the institution wins. The religious institution's invocation of a clear rule also lays a solid foundation for a case involving a civil rights non-discrimination employment law. These laws ban discrimination on categories like race, sex, religion, national origin. Some state laws also provide things like sexual orientation, gender identity. They can go further. Michigan's got like weight. You could have, you know, hair or other versions of your appearance, all of which states not the feds, have decided to add to these non-discrimination laws. But 
These laws, the federal civil rights laws and many local, regularly allow religious employers, religious institutions, to prefer people of their own faith, people who follow the tenets of their own religion. They get to do that. It's like the Democratic Party doesn't have to hire all Republicans, right? Um, and and the, the, the church gets to say, we have a mission and we get to prefer co-religionists, okay? Now, religious institutions can still fail to win a civil rights employment lawsuit even involving a person who has clearly rejected Catholic teaching and has even signed a contract that says, I will abide by Catholic teaching in my, my life at the school and in my public life. This can happen when a court determines, and we're not talking a minister here yet, just an average employee of a Catholic institution. This happens when a court says, listen, the real reason you fired this person isn't because they're a co uh, not a co-believer or have violated some tenet of your religion. You fired them for sex or race or something. Let me give you a case. This happened in Indiana. A woman has IVF. She's public about it. The pastor says, you really can't, um, you know, you've got to renounce going forward with this, or we can't really hire you again. You've made it public. She sues for sex discrimination. The church says, hey, you know, she just publicly denounced a teaching that we have and says she has no intention of following it and made it public. And at trial, it comes out that one of the eighth grade teachers, a male, had had a strip party for his bachelor party. And this was widely known. And he wasn't touched. So the local court says, this is sex discrimination, which I agree with. This is not on the basis, you're not hiring and firing based on religion. If you, if you really were, you would have treated them in the same manner. But you only went after the woman. Okay, so sometimes you can lose that way. Um, it's also a possibility that a state civil rights statute exempts only those religious institutions that almost exclusively hire and serve co-believers. They say you're not a religious institution if you take non-Catholic kids into the school or if you hire teachers who don't share your faith. But of course we know that many Catholic institutions hire and serve people of other faiths. That's a, a very restrictive statute. That's in, that's in Massachusetts. Most states aren't that restrictive, but you could, you could see one. In this kind of situation, the religious institution might then jump to another free exercise lily pad, if you will, and say, the job involved requires a minister, by which they mean a person who qualifies under this particular Supreme Court decision called Hosanna Tabor, it was about a Lutheran, a Lutheran school, uh, as to what is a minister. If you're not just an employee, but you're a minister of a religious institution, then, under a generalized free exercise uh, area about the autonomy of the church, this one particular piece of it, the ministerial exception, says the state cannot force you to hire someone to serve a ministerial role, and they cannot um, force you to take them back after you fire them, if they're a minister. Hosanna Tabor's ministerial factors are in dispute, but they are often summarized as looking to things like an employee's title, the actual substance of their work, their self-identification, and the functions performed. If the institution convinces the court that the employment is ministerial, the court cannot inquire one moment further about any of the dealings in the hiring or firing of this person. To do so would be considered for the state to be putting its foot right in the middle. Of, uh, of a theological decision about who is going to pass the faith on to the next generation. Who will speak about and shape and teach and pass on the faith. No matter the institution's rationale. In the Hazana Tabor case, it looked a lot like the, the Lutheran school refused to take the woman back on the grounds of a disability. No matter. She was clearly ministerial. And so the court did not inquire any further into that. By means of a successful claim of ministerial exception, a religious employer who for some reason can't take advantage of civil rights laws allowing them to hire co-religionists can still prevail in an employment discrimination lawsuit. In sum, no matter whether a complaint concerns a religious institution's refusal to bow to a, a legal mandate or whether it concerns the freedom to hire and fire its employees, a religious institution's statement, I can't, it's immoral plays an important role toward gaining a win. I want to propose, however, that this path, which is how religious institutions plead in their free exercise complaint when they file it in court, it's what they say in their briefs. This path 
of summarily rejecting a government mandate or an employee, while potentially a short-term winning strategy, is a potential long-term threat to religious freedom and to public support for religious freedom and even to the religious institution's integrity of mission. First, is it a threat, excuse me, first, it's a threat to religious freedom because it positions the institution in opposition to very highly prized 21st century values, especially the values when they're applied to sex, marriage, and parenting, equality, dignity, justice, care for the, the, the outcast. For example, it makes religious freedom appear to be a, please, may I have a license to discriminate against LGBT persons or against women, okay? Second, it offers no positive reason that might meet or even, even overcome a state's declared compelling state interest in requiring all institutions to bow to a particular mandate or non-discrimination law. Just to give you an example, there's a famous case with Wisconsin v. Yoder where a state wanted all kids to go to high school and the Old Order Amish in Wisconsin said we can't. We have data that it undermines the long-term stability of our religion and we have to begin teaching children about the interwoven work and family responsibilities that are part and parcel of our religion. And the Supreme Court of the United States says to the state, well, you do have a compelling interest in getting your kids educated, but for what purpose? And the state says, so they will be self-sufficient uh, members of, of the adult community in the state. And the state says to the, uh, uh, the, the Supreme Court says to the state, well, if there's anything the Amish are definitely doing, it's developing self-sufficient adult members of the community. And they've done it for 300 years. So in other words, the Amish's reason, not I can't, we don't go to school at that age. Instead, we are training them to be. Their positive reason for not sending them. This, it turns out they went to state one better. There was another case where some kids in Kansas who were Christians were denied living in a Christian dorm. And they said it makes them narrow thinking. Uh, we put them all in a dorm together so that they can meet people from, from all over and open up their minds and, and have a good place to study. And it turned out the Christian dorm had students from like, you know, 21 countries where the other dorm was like all white Kansas kids. It turned out the Christian dorm had all these great hours for studying and quiet and, was in, and meditation. And the kids actually did a lot better <laughs> than they did in, in the other dorm. So the positive reasons that they had for going in the Christian dorm actually outcompelled the state's compelling interest for the goals the state wanted to reach. I think Catholic institutions need to go in the same direction. A bare, I can't, it's wrong strategy also undermines the integrity of mission of Catholic institutions by several means. First, it allows the church just to recite a teaching of the universal church without any evidence that it either walks the talk or has even self-examined itself as to whether this, this teaching is really important to them. Second, given how many mandates and employment um, uh, protections today revolve around sexual expression, contraception, abortion, transgenderism, sexual orientation, even marital status, which was really put in non-discrimination laws to protect employers, credit card companies, and, and landlords from refusing to let women who were um, not married and didn't have their husband's credit to get jobs, credit, et cetera. That's what marital status, non-discrimination was for. Now it's being used to affirmatively protect cohabitants. So if the landlord says, I'm sorry, you're unmarried, I can't give you the bedroom, um, they are deemed to discriminate on the basis of marital status, even though the law was never. In fact, even states that still have a, a criminal ban on cohabitation have required landlords to give the bedroom <laughs> to these couples on the ground that marital status, non-discrimination, especially protects cohabitation. So, so many of the laws today revolve around sexual expression that every time Catholic institutions fail to articulate or even understand themselves how their teachings on sex, marriage, and parenting are positive and positively integrated into their Catholic identity, they harm themselves and the public. And third, by reducing the whole matter of passing on the faith to the ministerial exception because leave the minister alone, he passes on the faith. Reducing it to that, to, to the status and task of that particular person, by doing this, the religious institution suggests an ecclesiology at odds with Catholic teaching, both about the role of the laity and about the identity of, of the Catholic um, church as a community of union. 
Now, this is not to blame Catholic institutions or their attorneys for the way that free exercise law has developed, but it has invited this narrow manner of articulating a state-imposed burden. Um, now, you know, and, and, it, and they get rewarded for it. Judicial opinions reward clear statements of your teachings. And we have thousands of years uh, behind our teachings. We have clear writings. We have clear scriptures, okay? So it's a very easy thing for Catholic institutions to fall into this pattern. It should also be mentioned that, you know, a significant number of the disputes recently about sexual expression has, you know, not because it's so long established and because it's in writing, that Catholic institutions easily satisfy court's inquiry into whether the teaching is a religious one and whether they're sincere about it. There's lots of people going to the courts now trying to challenge um, uh, and to sort of almost make a mockery of religious freedom claims by dreaming up sort of crazy uh, religious practices and then demanding religious freedom for it. You've probably heard of the, the religion of the flying spaghetti monster, sometimes called the Pastafarians whose almost whole function is just to make religious freedom look ridiculous, right? We don't have that problem. We've got religious teachings that are long held, and we have sincerity. Uh, my presentation today will suggest that the Catholic Church and the courts ought to cease doing business on these terms. Current practices may yield short-term gains, may yield a religious freedom win in a particular case, but quite possibly these come at longer-term costs both for the cause of religious freedom and for institutions' own strength and integrity in Catholic mission. I think there's a better way to preserve religious freedom, which I will discuss at the very end of the presentation. So here's how I'm going to proceed. First, I'm going to describe the manner in which Catholic institutions currently plead when the law requires them to do something violating a religious teaching or hire or rehire somebody that they think violates their mission. Second, I'm going to describe some of the negative effects these pleadings provoke. Third, I'm going to sketch the manner in which pleading a list of sinful behaviors might undermine a Catholic institution's mission. Then I'm going to suggest, very briefly, a better legal approach. This is, you know, approximately 13 pages. Of, this is the first time I've publicly articulated my thoughts on this. I'm working on an article that looks to be about 100 pages long, you know, with proper legal footnotes and theological footnotes on this. But this is my first attempt to summarize this. Um, first, regarding Catholic institutions' current manner of establishing a burden when the law tries to get them to hire or rehire someone or do something against their teaching. You go and you look at the court filings of Catholic institutions in these types of lawsuits, and it's very instructive. Okay, Look at the complaints, look at the briefs they file when the case comes to the highest court where it's been heard. So let's look at the Little Sisters of the Poor litigation concerning the contraception mandate. Right. It would have required that religious order, if they had been a church, if they had been the bishop's office, if they had been uh, you know, um, uh, not doing a publicly charitable work, they would not have been subject to this mandate. But they were subject to a version of it um, to either provide their employees free contraception in their health care or to, um, to fill out a paper that allowed the Department of Health and Human Services to arrange with their insurance carrier both to educate their female employees and the daughters of employees about contraception and to ensure that they got a policy that provided it to them. Okay? Um, at the Supreme Court, the Little Sisters focused on Catholic disapproval of contraception and abortion. I mention abortion because the Health and Human Services contraception mandate admitted that four of the drugs or devices could act to kill an embryo. We didn't have to say this is a matter of religious belief. They scientifically admitted that's what's on the package inserts of these medical drugs and devices. So the Little Sisters relied on Catholic teaching on contraception and abortion. They framed their burden as following, being forced to, quote, comply with the contraceptive mandate or pay massive fines. They referred to, quote, religiously forbidden actions, unquote. Quote, forced sacrifice of sincerely held religious beliefs, and a, quote, mandate that runs counter to one of our most fundamental religious beliefs, unquote. In another lawsuit involving a federal mandate to undertake a behavior forbidden by, public, or by Catholic teaching, a Catholic hospital articulated its right not to perform transgender surgeries by saying, quote, as part of its religious practices, Franciscan provides care consistent with its religious beliefs. It follows the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services issued by the USCCB. 
They also said, quote, to provide or otherwise facilitate these services would violate our deeply held religious beliefs. And they claimed that, quote, providing coverage to these procedures constitutes impermissible material cooperation with evil, unquote. Turning to cases involving an assertion of religious employers' right to employ co-believers. In a case about the refusal to renew the contract of a grade school teacher who had publicly announced she was having IVF, this is the Indiana case I spoke of, the diocese in its pleading wrote, quote, according to church teaching stated in the catechism, these artificial methods, even when they involve only the father and mother, are morally unacceptable because they dissociate the sexual act from the procreative act, unquote. Now let's look at ministerial exception pleadings. There was a case in, in this diocese, Archdiocese of Chicago, in which the diocese successfully invoked the exemption concerning an organist who announced his impending marriage to a man. The Archdiocese case most largely focused upon the relationship between his musical tasks, noting their expressive, celebratory, sacred, and prayer and scripture enhancing qualities, and the church's mission. He was fired because of the, uh, the court's judgment that a person undertaking those tasks was a minister and should not be in violation of church teaching. The church could decide the kind of a minister who's publicly violating their teaching. In a similar case in Illinois, the same-sex married music director and organist was fired with the explanation that the church was in the rights, it was in its rights because, quote, your union is against the teachings of the Catholic Church, unquote, which is what they pleaded similarly in their filings. Finally, in a case in which a school in Massachusetts was forced to uh, rehire um, a man in an open same-sex marriage who was the uh, food service director, the school called his marriage, quote, incompatible with the school's mission and its expectation of its employees. They did not win the ministerial exemption uh, because the court said he wasn't a minister. His task did not include formally presenting the gospel values or the teachings of the Catholic Church. Let me turn to describing some of the negative effects in the legal marketplace. The, the, what I believe is going to be a reduction for Americans' stomach for religious freedom caused by these cases. First, there are negative reactions on the part of external observers. Perhaps no value is as lionized today in the US as equality or non-discrimination. Simple statements by Catholic institutions that a behavior is wrong, that they won't be complicit with it, provoke furious and negative reactions. Look at what's happening uh, right now in the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas on um, the bishop's decision not to have a same-sex couple enroll their children in the school. It's, watching the rhetoric kills me because I know we could do better, but anyway. Uh, this furious reaction is provoking calls to narrow religious freedom rights generally. There is a now infamous article put out by two Yale law professors, uh, Doug Najame and Reva Siegel. Um, uh, they are big same-sex marriage and abortion advocates, and they are furious at religious institutions' ability to win these cases where they're saying, we don't want to be complicit in moral behavior. This is what they write. Persons of faith are now seeking religious exemptions from laws concerning sex, reproduction, and marriage on the ground that the law makes the objector complicit in the assertively sinful conduct of others. The distinctive features of complicity-based conscience claims matter, not because they make the claim for religious exemption any less sincere, but because accommodating claims of this kind has the potential to inflict material and dignitary harms on other citizens. So this article is a recommendation that both our free exercise and our free speech rights be dramatically cabined because the facilitation claim is particularly pernicious. It is particularly hateful. And when we make such a claim, we should be shut down. The new expression, as you know, is deplatformed. We are simply too hateful to be given a platform. I remember when I was arguing the contraception mandate from a, um, from a religious freedom perspective with Columbia University has a Center for Reproductive Law and Policy where they, they, they uh, have fellowships and send professors into universities all over the US after their training there. And I was uh, debating the head of it. And at one point she just couldn't resist anymore. And she just said, people like you should not be heard in public. And I just sort of, I stood up for my students at that school of law and I was like, I said, I think I win. I hope you think I win. Just so that I, I think you know that that's really part and parcel of their argument, that we should be done here. But in fact, things have even moved so quickly in the last couple of years that that is considered a legitimate argument. And free speech, which was a, a, a very strong issue on the left, 
has now become something they would like to deplatform much more. And now you have interesting people on the right using free speech and free exercise far more. There is growing support for the view that dignity harms are legally actionable. You may recall the last report under the Obama administration's U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in which its chairman famously opined that religious liberty had become, quote, a code word for discrimination. On a related note, this didn't involve a Catholic institution, the movement to cabin free speech on the grounds of its violating dignity interests is gaining steam. In recent cases involving, whether it's a cake maker or a flower designer who doesn't want to cooperate and celebrate a same-sex wedding, or a landlord who doesn't want to give the bedroom to the unmarried cohabiting couples, um, they were held liable on the basis that they were harming people's sense of self and identity and dignity, um, not because people couldn't get other housing easily, in fact, very easily, or they couldn't find other cakes or flowers very easily, but because the, just the statement of your disagreement uh, was too harsh and you should be punished for that. A second threat to religious freedom posed by the I can't, it's immoral strategy, concerns the way in which such a pleading sets up the balance with the state's interests so as to advantage the state. Under much of religious freedom law, once a religious institution successfully articulates that a law burdens a religion, the state wins by showing it has a compelling state interest exercised by means least restrictive on religion. Compelling interests are these really important health, safety, welfare interests. That's what states can legislate on. It's called the police power. Uh, goals that states are constitutionally permitted to pursue. Courts are notoriously variable in deciding what's a compelling state interest. I mean, literally, they call that a landlord not insulting a young couple who wants to live together is a compelling state interest, even though there might be a hundred other landlords really willing to rent, which is really the case. It's probably more like a thousand to one willing versus unwilling landlords. But so what's called compelling is a very subjective judicial decision, okay? Religious institutions' negative claim, I can't, it's immoral, offers no positive reason that might meet or even overcome a state's declared compelling interest. Were the institutions to provide positive accounts of the purposes of their teaching, something I'll describe a little below, the state might in some cases deem the institution's policies, like in the Amish families, actually to further the state's own interest, not impede them. Um, a Christian, uh, when I describe the Christian dorm, I describe the Amish. Likewise, a Catholic institution might better demonstrate that its messaging and practices respecting sexual expression actually better satisfy a state's interest in <laughs> equality, freedom, and health than application of a state mandate or non-discrimination law could do. I write a great deal about how the Catholic anthropology of the human person especially advantages women whose preferences in connection with sex really are, although similar to men, even more firmly in the direction of linking it with commitment and the possibility of children. Um, if you look at the literature on the law and economics of the sex mating and marriage marketplace, you know, women would prefer marriage to cohabitation. During cohabitation, women are much more strongly of the mind that this will move toward marriage and that it should move toward marriage. Um, women in every one of the hookup books, which I was forced to read in preparation for writing my own book, um, will talk about the, the lack of, of dignity that they feel in engaging in some of the, the, the hookup uh, culture that exists, which is not you know, the majority of people, but when it is there, it's very demeaning, um, and, and talk about its long-term effects on them and how much they would love to have a real date and a real conversation and a real relationship. The church's anthropology better supports women's actual equality and dignity and freedom in this regard. Third, religious institutions' current strategy can also de facto shrink religious freedom when used in a case of ministerial exemption. To wit, if religious organizations plead and courts exempt, uh, a claim of ministerial exemption using the ordinary tests of Hosanna Tabor, What's your self-identification? What's the substance of your work? What's your title? What's your function? It's easy to assume that an important part of a religious, religion's freedom to manifest and transmit its faith has been preserved. But in fact, as I'll describe below, there's no insurance that this particular employee is actually important to communicating the faith. Had the church really thought of it before they were forced to make that claim? No, we can't hire the food service director who's same sex married. Have they really thought of it before? Or is it just a statement that comes out of their mouth because it's diocesan policy? 
And in fact, the personnel who actually do effectively communicate the faith might easily fall outside the tests of Hosanna Tabor. Let me also turn now to the manners in which the I can't, it's immoral strategy undermines the Catholic institution's own, I think, integrity of mission. First, it allows the institution to rely upon a reciting of, the uni of a teaching of the universal church without necessary reflection and expression about how the teaching is instantiated within this institution. If this statement, I can't, is all that's required to meet the burden uh, prong of a free exercise case or answer the who is a minister question or the claim, does this person, uh, is this person a co-believer who I need to employ or not, then why dig deeper and prove that the institution walks the talk? Second, given how many of the mandates and employment protections revolve around sex, the I can't strategy allows Catholic institutions to fail specifically to articulate how their understandings of Catholic anthropology on sex, marriage, and parenting are integrated into the actual life of their community. I am totally ready to write a book on this subject when I get the time, because it makes me crazy. And it will be in the legal arena, but we'll have to draw upon theologians heavily. It will have to suffice today to observe that, despite John Paul II's theology of the body, it's my conclusion that the Catholic Church, and here I mean all of us, has not yet produced a satisfying and well-known discussion of why it is that our particular teaching about sexual expression has played such an important role in defining our identity from the beginning of Christianity to today. For those of you interested in some historical material on that, Kyle Harper's book, From Shame to Sin, he's a historian that talks about the move from the honor-shame code dealing with abortion in Roman society to the Christian introduction of a discussion of sex that was about how God loves, how the human body has to manifest that God became man and, and we are in God's image, how it is that it was so freeing because it applied to slave and master alike and to male and female alike, where the honor-shame code made strict divisions between higher and lower. And Kyle Harper's book is amazing and talks about the important role that the Christian, the Christian sex, marriage, and parenting ethic played in defining their entire communal message at that time. Roger Wilkins, I think that's his name, has written the book on the first thousand years of Christianity. Sarah Rudin, a classic scholar at Yale, in her book, Paul Among the People, and in some other writings, does an incredible job of talking about how this became part of Christian's definition of self, self from the very beginning. Embedded in this discussion is one about why our thinking on sex is related overall to our identity as believers in Jesus Christ. I can only, you know, touch and, and move on to this today, it's so huge. Instead, we give the impression that somewhere on that big intellectual organization chart of Catholicism in the sky, we have the elements of the creed, we have our social justice miss, a mission, and then there's this sex stuff hanging out for target practice right about here, okay? But there are no connecting lines between them in that big organization chart in the sky, or often in the minds of the average Catholic institution who really doesn't understand how to articulate this and would have to be mightily assisted to doing so. They, they do not understand how, I think it was John the 23rd, and I just finished reading a biography of Luigi Gisani where uh, in English that just came out that um, John the 23rd is quoted there where he says that these teachings have to flow like a waterfall out of the source, not be these discrete, as I like to say, you know, separated for target practice kinds of teaching. We have never well enough explained, in my view, for example, how our respect for God as creator of the human body and our understanding of the nature of human relationality as, in a, as a constitutive aspect of ourselves, relationality across differences, or our responsibilities to children, all of which form part of our discussion of same-sex marriage, also support our worship of God, our commitment to social justice, the way we treat every person in our life. We have not well enough explained how severing sex from tomorrow, from commitment, kin, marriage, children, and so forth, also undercuts our understanding of what is our relationship with God and what is the love relationship we are to have with every other person. A simple, I can't, it's immoral, allows us to avoid this entire discussion. Third, by reducing the process of passing on the faith to the status and tasks that qualify an institution for a ministerial exemption, I think religious institutions are suggesting an ecclesiology at odds with Catholic understanding. 
one that forgets the role played by every baptized Catholic and the unified Catholic community in communicating Christ to our contemporaries as a live and not a 2,000-year-old memory. And here is where, of course, being a lawyer, and, and just enough theology to really mess up, uh, I think that this ecclesiology, as found especially in Lumen Gentium and Christopher Dallas Laity, is best summarized, and I, I was just happened to be reading the Gitani biography, and I found this line, and I'm like, I'll just take it. This is a great summary. In his book, uh, well, also I was reading Why the Church, so like for time number six. Anyway, um, he writes that the church is what? The answer to the question, how can people who encounter Christ thousands of years after his physical disappearance from the earth be enabled to realize that he corresponds to the truth that he claims? How can they know this with a reasonable degree of certainty? I just love that. And, and he illustrates it so beautifully. And we all know that we've met people who do that for us, for, for, to whom we say, to quote another of a great title of Luigi Chani's series, yes, it's possible to live this way. I've seen it done. I have felt the onrush of hope. I have felt the absence of fear when I encountered these people. Chani recounts Jesus' method of teaching even at the very beginning even while he was still on earth, sending out people in groups of his uh, apostles to teach others. Today, even as we embrace reason alongside openness to revelation as important parts of the Catholic method for encountering Christ, we cannot ever forget that we are communal in nature. And it's life in that community called together by the witness of a person and united by our faith in Christ communities in which these institutions clearly are supposed to flow from our unity, not separately. Communities witnessing to him so as to give other people the impression that it is right and possible to live this way. It is this life and this work that transmits the faith, not just the discrete task of picking a song that could enhance worship or walking with students to a weekly mass. Nearly every Catholic who has stopped to think about this method of transmitting the faith can tell a story from their own life in the Catholic community that bears out the truth of this ecclesiology. Let me now speak briefly in my final part about a better legal approach for Catholic institutions and courts to pursue than identifying a discrete point of teaching that cannot be violated by the institution or a would-be employee. This strategy, I think, should better attract public support for religious freedom and better instantiate integrity of mission into Catholic institutions. So again, this is going to require a great deal of work on the part of Catholic institutions themselves. I remember going to my kid's own principal in the parish school and saying, uh, have you listened to the boys on the way? Have you driven the boys to baseball lately? Have you heard how they're talking about the girls? Maybe we need to have the following conversation. And I handed her a few notes. And she said, oh, this is awesome. I don't think any of the teachers know this. Can we start with the teachers? And could we catechize the teachers? And then we'll catechize the students. And I thought, wonderful. So I'm not underestimating what this would take. First thought, a Catholic institution should never simply plead, I can't, it's immoral. It should always also explain how the doctrinal point is lived out in the institution's life and should be prepared to give concrete examples. This is not that complicated. Usually courts will accept what Catholic institutions say because we're so long established and we have so many things in writing. But um, it's not unheard of for the court to just ask the question about sincerity, right? So uh, the Hobby Lobby case with the, the, the Green family closely held corporation that said, we don't want to provide the four drugs and devices that HHS says can kill embryos. We're cool with contraception, we're not cool with these. The Green family had to demonstrate its bona fides. There's like, here's our corporate mission statement. Um, we don't provide anything related to alcohol in our stores. This is my personal favorite is, we don't backhaul beer. You know when trucks go out and they bring things to stores? They make a lot of money by putting beer in the truck and taking it back to the place of the truck's origin. And that's how most trucking sort of manages to keep solvent. The Greens give up that. They didn't do any backhauling of beer. They took a huge hit in their trucking profits because of that. So just a, a brief demonstration of things that say this is our sincerity. Is this risk, does this risk nosing your, the, the, the state into the church's business? To a degree. Um, but that, I think, is well worth managing uh, for what I'm proposing. Um, second, on matters touching Catholic, uh, or matters touching sexual expression, um, in addition to satisfying the first recommendation, uh, the institution should explain, a la the way the Amish did it, or the Christian students at the house in the Kansas University, how human flourishing 
dignity, equality, freedom, happiness, is advanced by example respecting every vulnerable human life or honoring the body's natural ecology. I have to say current data is so good on this that I would say we base it on reason, it is affirmed by revelation, it is further illuminated by that, here's what we teach. Third, institutions should make far more use of church autonomy doctrine in combination with a conscientious objection or a ministerial exemption claim. Church autonomy refers to the right of churches, and the Supreme Court has recognized it, to make decisions about things like discipline, faith, doctrine, church government, free from oversight or interference by the civil law. Uh, this has been applied to institutions, religious institutions, not just churches. The doctrine flows from things like the lack of subject matter jurisdiction of the civil court over theology or canon law, and without a competence in those areas. It also flows from the First Amendment protection of the free exercise of religion. When the church autonomy rule was affirmed most recently, it was a limited piece of it, the ministerial exemption, but it does exist more broadly as well. I emphasize the use of the church autonomy claim, not only given all that I've said about the tendency of the I can't claim to bring unfortunate consequences, but I think the church autonomy ground is also important because it allows us, it actually requires us to communicate to ourselves and outside observers what the church actually is and how it actually functions as a community of faith, witnessing in all aspects of our lives to the living God. Now, final words here in objection to this. I expect that some will react against the burden I'm putting on religious institutions. My arguments might suggest that a church institution is rightly coerced by the state to violate its beliefs if the best it can muster is an I can't, it's immoral claim. Not so. I don't think the state can force the little sisters of the poor to provide contraception in its health care, no matter how the sisters frame their true, sincere religious objection. But I do think it would be better for the little sisters, including for their own understanding of their own mission, as well as for the edification of those who read about religious freedom struggles every day in the paper now, if they would amplify their statement of conscientious objection to include how their Catholic identity resonates through the institution. I don't think this will necessarily involve an intrusive inquiry by the court. It's a way of our stating it to them. They already believe us, but I want a statement that will carry to the public beyond even this lawsuit. In fact, a court might decide not to look at all behind an institution's statement, I can't, it's against our teaching. But even if it did, it should not be difficult to point to writings, teachings, practices, activities going on in that institution that demonstrate how these beliefs are both sincerely held and truly lived within the mission of that institution. Others might conclude that it's too much to ask an institution today to put its sexual teachings out front and up there. And I can tell you that you know, there's a huge issue with this. Now, the problem is, whether we like it or not, they're going to be out front and up there because um, not only the sexual abuse scandal, but also because these are the stuff of the news today. It's, it's um, I don't know how many, many of you ever uh, uh, followed Mike Python, uh, the news for parrots. So there's news, right, and it doesn't really much involve parrots, but if you want to do news for parrots, you say things like, there's been a pile up on the interstate, no parrots were involved, right? So <laughs> today, the quality of news coverage is, you know, uh, such and such happened, you know, they're going to put up a new building downtown and we're questioning how this is going to involve sexual orientation and gender identity issues. I mean, that's, it is out there, not speaking to it and saying, we keep getting asked to respond to this and so we will. Not responding to it is not helpful to ourselves or to others. We, we are living through a moment in history and, you know, I have many questions for God even when I get to meet him. But one of them is, what role did this time in history and this particular dynamic play in the economy of salvation? <laughs> Please take your time, because I really would like to have the answer to why the culture is demanding so much uh, on this and putting us uh, 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 on the defensive on this so often. Um, it is true that people are sick of the culture wars. It is true that Catholic institutions don't like to talk about this. They would like to actually do the charitable and educational and other work that they're doing. They would like to be what Pope Francis uh, asked NGOs to be, um, uh, not just another NGO in the church, but an actual Catholic charity, okay? They would like to do that. But I would respond there that we don't have any choice. It's out there in the culture, and if we don't say something, there will be a vacuum on, on the, the truthful 
the, the, the freedom producing, the happiness enhancing side of these issues. And we haven't even tried sufficiently to verbalize positively, comprehensively, briefly, but compassionately, the harmony between our sex, marriage, and parenting teacher, teachings, and our identity as people created from love, for love, by a God who is love. I would also suggest that in an environment in which so many human beings' unhappiness is tied to sexual confusion or family structure deficits, which are related to this, uh, it's not too much to ask of us to try. Finally, I realize the sexual abuse crisis has all but vaporized the potential of the universal or even national level you know, church structures. Uh, and even most or maybe all bishops to do what I recommend here today. Therefore, it must be the hour of the local parish, the local institution, the local priest, the local sisters, the local lay to do all of this. It's only too obvious to ask, you know, if not us, then who? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alberry. We do move now into that part of our program where we will hear two responses from members of the USML faculty. Uh, the first will come uh, from Sister Kathleen Mitchell uh, and will be directed to the first of uh, Professor Alberry's uh, addresses. Sister Kathleen Mitchell is a Franciscan Sister of Perpetual Adoration. She's Associate Dean of Formation and Assistant Professor in the Department of Pastoral Theology at Mundelein Seminary. Her primary responsibility here is as Associate Director of the Teaching Parish Program, which is Mundelein's innovative approach to experiential education, where a seminarian is assigned to a local parish where he will work under a pastor supervisor in dialogue with a uh, parish committee of laymen and women and across four or five years in that same parish, build ministerial relationships and assume greater responsibility in ministerial leadership. All of this along with and in integration with the theological curriculum. Sister Kathleen, as I mentioned, has also taught in the, our Department of Pastoral Theology. Prior to joining our faculty, she was pastoral associate of St. Mary Parish in Evanston, Illinois, and has worked closely in various ministries with religious, clergy, lay women, and men. Throughout her ministry, she served in teaching, faith formation, young adult ministry, vocational ministry, and ministry with media. Sister Kathleen holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Communication from Emanuel University in Boston, Master of Education from Loyola University of Chicago, and a Master of Arts and Doctor of Ministry degrees from the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. She enjoys working with persons of other cultures and feels she is the best of herself when ministering in settings that mirror the Catholic Church and the world in all its diversity. Please welcome Sister Kathleen Mitchell. Thank you, Father Bema. It's a joy to be with you here today and to again hear Professor Helen Alvarez speak. I first met Helen a number of years ago in Boston when she gave a presentation on single motherhood. I remember being deeply impressed with her commitment to the sanctity of all life, and my admiration for her has only grown over the years. Helen has made enormous contributions to the church, to the academic community, and to the wider world. 
i have followed her life's work and i am delighted to be with her today together as we consider the importance of family a few years ago i met a wonderful woman from kenya who came to the united states to study in a graduate program she was bright enthusiastic and eager to learn as we talked she shared with me her struggles about being in the united states she recounted how when she first arrived in our country people were very welcoming and told her that if she needed anything just to let them know however she went on to tell me that when she did need help to know where to shop how to do public transportation, and simply be introduced to others, she was left alone. No one offered to help her, and no one had time when she asked. She was confused because she wanted to make friends, and instead found that no one seemed to care. She said that the initial welcome she received was simply a one-time moment, and the words were devoid of meaning. About six months later, this woman returned to Kenya because she felt isolated and alone. This conversation, and many others similar to it, have challenged me and left me wrestling with important questions these past several years. I say this because I believe the stability of our family structures and our society as a whole rests on strong relationships. And I am convinced that indifference and hyper-individualism are having drastic consequences in our families, our society, and our church. The experience I just shared about the woman from Kenya speaks to the hyper-individualism and the indifference that make us pretend not to notice. We become incapable of looking beyond ourselves and we close our hearts to the needs of others. This happens in many ways in our society, our parishes, our institutions, and it happens in families. In Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis writes, equal consideration needs to be given to the growing danger represented by an extreme individualism, which weakens family bonds and ends up considering each member of the family as an isolated unit. Extreme individualism is one of the concrete issues that families face today, and it is often the children who suffer the most. Yesterday, our keynote speaker spoke about an individualism that focuses on personal freedoms that exclude the needs of children. She addressed the important relationship between family structure and child well-being and outlined how government and legal systems often prioritize the desires of adults sexual expression over children's welfare she also spoke about the strengthening and widening and solidifying gaps between rich and poor and how this adversely affects the life outcomes of the most vulnerable in our society. These issues raise an important pastoral question. How do we make children and the most vulnerable in our society a priority for us and for our parishes? At the root of all these issues, I see a question that we as church need to answer. Will we be our sisters and brothers keepers? All around us, we see the steep costs of hyper-individualism and indifference. 
a sense of isolation and loneliness that keeps many up at night, government and media messages that pr promote narcissism, vast inequalities in our society that cause whole groups of people to be invisible. And the thing we often forget, the effects of all this on our children. In addition, we must remember that we see the spiritual cost in parishes where we are strangers to one another. These are the words that speak hyper-individualism and an indifference. Me first, my time, my rights, and not my problem. On the contrary, reaching out, opening ourselves to relationships, engaging others in conversation, moving out of our comfort zones, being vulnerable, and serving something greater than ourselves is what the life of Jesus embodies for us. In fact, it was Christ who first encountered us in love, and it is he who enables us to see our sisters and brothers created in God's image and love. Indeed, to love another person is to see the face of God. We are living in a difficult time, as Helen Alvarez just said, both in our church and in our society. And so often it can seem that we are walking in darkness. However, this time can also be a great time of renewal and opportunity to build further communion among us. In fact, it can be a time when we more readily see the light. As Barbara Brown Taylor says, there is a light that shines in the darkness which is only visible there. The church and the world need us to name that light in the darkness and together hold it high so others can walk in it. We name that light when we see the grace of God working in each person's life and in the most difficult of family situations. And we hold high the light when we reach out to accompany these persons and families in our parishes, never stigmatizing what is less than perfect. Many of us I hear, here, I imagine, come from dysfunctional families, but with God's grace have become resilient and even more compassionate, more pastoral, more merciful because of these struggles. Maybe we walked in darkness when our mother held down two jobs and dad was absent, or when we suffered the effects of divorce or abuse, or when we watch a parent, a brother, or a sister struggle with addiction. We shine a bright light when we welcome and accompany those who walk the path we once walked. We cast a light for others when our hearts grow bigger and we truly see a brother, a sister, a neighbor, a friend in that other. No matter their race, their ethnicity, their religion, their family background, their socioeconomic or immigration status. We cast the light when we walk with that forgotten child and prioritize the most vulnerable in our society. The issues before us may seem overwhelming, and we may already advocate for change and to promote opportunities to improve the lives of the marginalized in our society. But what else can we do? As a seminary community, and as men and women dedicated to ministry in the church and the world, we need to be countercultural. While I was praying about this presentation, I asked myself what countercultural would look like. What is the opposite of indifference and individualism? 
The images that came to me were these. Being there for others, caring, compassion, commitment, attention, interest in others, involvement, and encuentro. Helen Alderay challenged us to alter course in our adults for society and build a future of stable relationships that serve both adults and children. How do we turn the tide? Pope Francis has repeatedly asked us to move from excessive individualism and indifference to a culture of encounter. Now in English, we think of encounter a bit differently than how it is understood in Spanish. In Spanish, encuentro connotes a search that is both deeply personal and transformational. We promote a culture of encuentro in pastoral ministry when we build relationships, when we create ways and places for people to feel that they belong. We do this when we waste time with a neglected child or invite a struggling family to meet with us and get to know them as sacred persons. Encuentro also signifies going beyond the walls of our institutions and parishes. Pope Francis reminds us every Christian and every community must discern the path that the Lord points out. But all of us are asked to obey his call to go forth from our own comfort zone in order to reach all the peripheries in need of the light of the gospel. We need to make a special effort to encounter those at the peripheries who are often invisible and ignored by the world. Here at Mundelein Seminary, our goal is to form parish priests who want to be close to people and who are men for others in service of the church and the world. Our vision must not be insular. Instead, it demands relationships that stretch us. Relationships shape priests as they do all people. For priests, the relationships with the Trinitarian God and with the people of God are pivotal. We need to become experts in building relationships in the seminary and then helping create this communion in families, communities, institutions, and parishes. In a homily last week, our rector, Father John Carchi, said, we need to allow others to gaze into our hearts. This requires vulnerability. We allow others to gaze into our hearts when we share our love of God with others, when we strengthen our capacity for compassion and refuse to be insular or desensitized to the suffering of our sisters and brothers. We embody this when we reach beyond our comfort zones and open our hearts to those who are different from us. I think of the words of Bishop Conlon at the recent celebration of Mundelein. If we only look in the mirror, it can be delusional. The goal of our mission in the church is to be in relationship. An ecclesiology of communion focuses on relationships with God, with one another, and on the church as an experience of communion. Because of our culture of individualism, many in our families and parishes lack a sense of belonging. Pope Francis notes that some of our parishes and communities are simply unwelcoming and that in many places, an administrative approach prevails over a pastoral approach. But what if we developed pastoral initiatives that made a priority of encuentro? What if marriage preparation was a real priority in our parishes? 
What if Encuentro was the way we welcomed and accompanied individuals and families who experience a fa a human love has been marked by pain and brokenness? What if we looked for new ways to encounter families and build bridges of relationships? What if we crossed our traditional boundaries to encounter the poor and suffering on our city streets and in our world? What if we were shakers and movers who created una cultura del encuentro that always started with the person, the relationship? Let me end with a story. A few months ago, I had a wonderful visit with a priest who holds an important position in his diocese. This priest is close to the people he serves and is loved as a man for others. He works tirelessly with families, reaches out to children, and works for change in society. In the course of our conversation, he shared with me about his family and his struggles growing up with an absent father and a mother and younger siblings who counted on him. The first thing I noticed was that he was vulnerable and allowed me to gaze into his heart. The second thing that stood out to me was that this priest named the grace of God in the middle of his own pain. His vocation to priesthood, his ability to show compassion, his love for children, and his commitment to be a person of encuentro. When I think of this story and of many others, I remember the wonderful passage from Genesis 28. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. May we be forces for change in our society and in our church. There is much to be done. At the same time, let us name God's grace at work in each person and in each family, even in the most difficult of situations. This is my commitment. I hope it is yours as well, and that we will hold each other accountable. Thank you. All right, well, we thank you, Sister Kathleen, very much. We've been sitting for a long time, and so I think it's probably appropriate for the sake of the program that we take a in-place break. So what I would like you to do is a little break exercise. Uh, if everyone would stand up. Now, look around you for someone you don't know. Introduce yourself to them and tell them one thing that you've been thinking about us during this uh, talk uh, that is an insight you want to take with you and just take a moment and encounter one another and in uh, just uh, four or five minutes we'll call up Father Olson to continue.
If I could call everyone back to order. I'm very pleased now to introduce the next of our faculty respondents. The Reverend David Olson is a priest of the Diocese of La Crosse and assistant professor in the departments of dogmatic theology and pre-theology. He teaches courses in the Doctrine of God, Ecclesiology, and the Documents of Vatican II. He's the author of Christology in the Context of Interreligious Dialogue, Thomas Aquinas and Jacques Dupuy, A Comparative Analysis. This, this is a dissertation which examines the proposals for a Trinitarian Christology by Dupuy and proposes an alternative approach based in the Christology of St. Thomas Aquinas as found in Summa Contra Gentilis. Prior to joining the faculty of Mundline Seminary, Father Olson served as associate pastor of St. Michael's Parish in Wausau, Wisconsin, pastor of Blessed Sacrament Parish in La Crosse, and pastor of the Newman Catholic Parish in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Before entering seminary, he was a practicing attorney. Father Olson received a Bachelor of Arts degree from St. Norbert College, the Doctor of Jurisprudence from the University of Wisconsin Law School, the STB, MDiv, and STL from the University of St. Mary of the Lake, he did postgraduate studies at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, where he was awarded the Doctorate in Sacred Theology. Please welcome Father David Olson. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning, and I had a chance to talk to Dr. Uh, to Dr. Professor Alvare last night a little bit, and told her that I'm going to um, throw out a few points for discussion here, and I, I characterize it as perhaps not theological um, hand grenades, but at least some flash bangs. Um, I think the purpose of this is to discuss stuff, and I, I want us to do that very much so. I also realize that most all of us are not lawyers, so I want to do just a little bit of a rehearsal again what, of what some of Dr. Elbray, uh, I keep calling you Dr., but Professor Elbray had to say. So the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States provides two explicit protections regarding religion. First, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, and secondly, that Congress will make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. The free exercise clause is often a shield protecting a religious belief or practice, what Professor Albrecht has called the I can't, it's wrong sort of defense. The establishment clause is most often used, but certainly not exclusively, against some religious body to prevent government from endorsing religion. Most of us are perhaps familiar with the idea that it's used to challenge things like vouchers to private school education, to Christmas trees and crosses on public property. Religious institutions enjoy a right to autonomy or freedom from government interference, which involves both the free exercise clause and the establishment clause. This has developed into the church autonomy doctrine. It's well settled that government cannot specifically target any one religion or religious practice for regulation but the state can apply general and neutral laws and regulations to churches. Think here of property laws and safety laws, employment laws, fire code regulations, etc., etc. Anything with a general and neutral applicability where the law does not just single out churches. In 1969, the Supreme Court applied this neutral principles idea to a property dispute involving the Presbyterian Church. The Supreme Court said the First Amendment allowed the court to apply the neutral laws of the state regarding property disputes, but forbid the court from resolving disputed issues of religious doctrine and practice. One question that had been presented to the lower courts 
was whether the Presbyterian Church had actually changed its doctrine. And the court said, quote, there are neutral principles of law developed for use in all property disputes, which can be applied without establishing or without favoring any particular church to which property is awarded. But First Amendment values are plainly jeopardized when church property litigation is made to turn on the resolution by civil courts of controversies over religious doctrine and practice. This established the general rule that courts should not intrude where the matter involves church governance, doctrine, or practice if that intrusion requires the court to analyze the beliefs or internal workings of the church. The rule is applied to many other settings than just property law. That's where it arose. For the sake of simplicity, we can say that religious institutes have a couple of different approaches to defending themselves against state regulations. First, the free exercise clause, and that amounts to the I can't, it's wrong sort of defense. And then as well, what is usually considered a broader defense, the church autonomy defense, the church autonomy doctrine, the general principle that the state should not intrude on the church making its own internal decisions. I read with interest the proposal by Professor Elvray on rethinking what she has characterized as the I can't, it's wrong defense, and utilizing such defenses along with a broader church autonomy defense in First Amendment pleadings. I think it raises some wonderful questions for discussion. And part of what I want to do here is toss out a few issues to stir up discussion. As I take Professor Elvray's proposal, religious institutions should utilize a more robust defense of doctrines and practices. This would look like, one, arguing the shield of free exercise or of ministerial exception, but as well, secondly, a positive exposition of how doctrine and practice are fully integrated into the institution, how we walk the talk. And third, showing how these also meet the state's own goals of promoting health and welfare of its citizens. Overly simplified, it may be a caricature. It tells the state to leave us alone because we have a well-worked out system, and if allowed our own autonomy, it will also fulfill positive values of the state. There is much I agree with in what has been stated by Professor Elvray. I would agree that narrow pleadings put us in the position of repeating what the church is against. Values such as inclusiveness and tolerance, fairness and even compassion are lost in the laundry list of what we are against. At least public opinion thinks so. And I agree that we as a church need to address the public perception, including the public of our own church. And I agree with Professor Elvray that negative, I can't, it's wrong court arguments inhibit us from showing how we may actually be real partners with the state in promoting compelling state interests. Though as Professor Elvray alludes to, the definition of what may be a compelling state interest promoting the health and welfare of citizens is not certain. The church autonomy doctrine may seem as a limitation on the role of the courts in respecting church autonomy and applying at most only neutral principles of law. But this has not stopped some courts from interpreting the church autonomy doctrine in a manner which involves significant examination of church practices and procedures. There's a case called Moses versus the Diocese of Colorado. It's an Episcopal diocese, so not to be too worried. This is a Catholic. This is a 1993 case involving a vulnerable married adult woman named Tenantry who was sexually abused by an associate pastor, Father Robinson. The woman had significant psychological issues and she became infatuated with the young and handsome Father Robinson. The associate took advantage of the woman in the course of confessional practice within this Episcopal church and this continued for some time after. Though the senior pastor became aware of the affair, he recommended the associate be promoted to pastor of a different parish. And he also told Tenantry, the young woman, that Father Robinson was, quote, bishop material and that she should not ruin his career. The Episcopal church, the Episcopal bishop approved the new assignment, gave Father Robinson a book entitled Affair Prevention and told him to get counseling. The specific facts of the case led to an award to Tenantry on the grounds of failure of fiduciary duty by the bishop and the diocese 
and negligent hiring and supervision in the employment of the associate. The Colorado Supreme Court said this, the facts of Tenantry's case indicate that an organization confronted with the misdeeds of one of its agents assumed control of the matter and in the process of protecting itself injured a vulnerable individual. The defendants had not argued that Bishop Fry's decision to assume control and revolve the prop and resolve the problems created by Father Robinson and Tenantry's relationship was a matter of purely ecclesiastical concern. So they didn't hold up one defense. Tenantry's claims in this case do not involve disputes within the church and are not based solely on ecclesiastical or disciplinary matters which would call into question the trial court's power to render a judgment against the defendants. Our decision, the court said, does not require a reading of the Constitution and canons of the Protestant Episcopal Church or any other documents of church governance. Because the facts of this case do not require interpreting or weighing church doctrine and neutral principles of law, the neutral principles of law can be applied and the First Amendment is not a defense against Tenantry's claims. Now I provide this example of stupidity and institutional protection by a non-Catholic church, perhaps because misery loves company, but more to show that the church autonomy doctrine as applied in various courts is not always a strong shield against the state. The court's inquiry became highly fact dependent, involving questions of the counseling practices of the church and of the bishop. This intrusive fact analysis by the courts is part of the concern I have with the proposal by Professor Albury. Part of her proposal is to show to the courts and by extension to the public what the church is for and how that works well with state interests. Most Catholics, I believe, are aware of what the church is against. Most of them would be well pleased, I think, to be better able to say what the church is for. Perhaps it is simply easier to state what one is against than to state what one is for because the latter requires a more in-depth and oftentimes a nuanced expression. However, I think a deeper reality is also present and this, I think, is key. Doctrine and practice within the Catholic Church is also developing. While doctrine is anchored in tradition, the interpretation and practice do develop and variations in local churches is to be expected as interpretation and synthesis are formed over time. I understand the attraction of holding up an idealized doctrine and saying that this is what we believe and this is how we put it into practice, but in every sphere of church life, including its moral teaching and practice, there is development. Different ways of expressing truth and also fuller understandings of truth come about with time and with the influence of grace. Pope Francis said this, for those who long for a monolithic body of doctrine guarded by all and leaving no room for nuance, this might appear as undesirable and leading to confusion, but in fact such variety serves to bring out and to develop different facets of the inexhaustible riches of the gospel. In other words, development and local varieties of application serves a real purpose within the church. Certainly one of the challenges among the laity is to be able to articulate the Catholic faith. Given the current structures of church governance and the governance and teaching are under the control of bishops and by extension priests. Thus the educational challenge lies with the clergy. For this reason, it is a grave mistake to weaken or to devote less time to the academic pillar of seminary education as one prominent American churchman has recently advocated. Going back to the Council of Trent, which established seminaries precisely for the purpose of academic training to meet cultural challenges, the church has known that pastoral practice can never be a substitute for academic training. Those who would be official teachers in the church cannot themselves be ignorant. For better or worse, the laity look to the clergy for both guidance in teaching and for inspiration to live that teaching in their lives. And this means, my dear seminarians, that both challenge and opportunity abound. Now, let me provide just a couple of examples where conflicting interpretations 
and development of doctrine and practice are ongoing in the Catholic Church. And then they bring this back to the discussion of how it may play out in the context of the expansive pleading of cases which Professor Elbray has proposed. John Paul II's Theology of the Body, published in 1997 from a series of conferences by, by the Pope from 1979 to 1984, has been lauded by papal biographer George Weigel. He said, quote, if taken with the seriousness it deserves, John Paul's Theology of the Body may prove to be the decisive moment in exercising the Manichaean demon and its deprecation of human sexuality from Catholic moral theology. He said, few moral theologians have taken our embodiedness as male and female as seriously as John Paul II, unquote. On the other hand, Luke Timothy Johnson, former Benedictine and professor emeritus at Emory University, wrote this about theology of the body. The Pope's subtitle is Human Love in the Divine Plan, but no real sense of human love as actually experienced emerges in these reflections. John Paul II thinks of himself as doing phenomenology, but never seems to look at actual human experience. Instead, he dwells on the nuances of words and biblical narratives and declarations while fantasizing an ethereal and all-encompassing mode of mutual self-donation between man and woman that lacks any of the messy, clumsy, awkward, charming, casual, and just silly aspects of love in the flesh. In the Pope's formulations, human sexuality is observed by telescope from a distant planet. Solemn pronouncements are made on the basis of textual exegesis rather than living experience. The effect is something like that of a sunset painted by the unsighted." Unquote. There are competing notions of even the value of some magisterial but non-definitive teachings and conflicts in the interpretations of teachings such as John Paul II's theology of the body, even among those who embrace it. It is little wonder that Catholics have difficulty expressing what the church teaches. The other example to proper is that of Pope Francis's 2016 post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia. While this lengthy document mostly repeated accepted church teaching on family life, chapter eight became the source of a firestorm of debate within the Catholic Church. Cardinals issued a challenge to the Pope with dubia, claiming serious questions are left unanswered by the document. A popular conservative writer branded Amoris Laetitia a decentralized quasi-Anglican approach to the post-sexual revolution and declared it a mere heresy creating de facto schism. On the other hand, bishops and theologians who support the document say that chapter eight calls for pastoral application in particular circumstances, nothing new, and does not raise any questions over doctrine either concerning marriage or the Eucharist. Supporters allege that critics want some platonic ideal of religion to correspond to some ideal of life. The document has already seen various interpretations and various applications in different Episcopal conferences and dioceses. Both of these examples show that wading into the flowing stream of church teaching and practice is the province of the intellectually nimble and sure-footed. This is not the place for those without considerable familiarity and experience with the tradition, and I suggest a sense of wonder at the work of God's grace in particular instances. A familiarity and wonder which civil courts simply would not possess. In principle, I applaud the idea that the Catholic Church and presumably other religious institutions as well would look to a well-integrated understanding of their own beliefs and that this well-integrated understanding and practice could be argued in cases under the First Amendment church autonomy doctrine. And further, that when a doctrine or practice is challenged by the state, the religious institution be able to publicly present how those beliefs and practices in fact would fit into the broader scheme of promoting the common good. That would be all rather neatly packaged. The problem 
is that real life and real church doctrine and practice are never so neatly packaged. Church doctrine and practice develop over time. The Catholic Church, both in its magisterium and in the baptized as a whole, is guided by the Holy Spirit. But this is no simple linear process. John Henry Cardinal Newman, in an essay on the development of Christian doctrine, says at one point regarding the seeming inconsistency of development, quote, I grant that there are bishops against bishops in church history, fathers against fathers, fathers even against themselves, for such differences in individual writers are consistent with, or rather are involved in, the very idea of doctrinal development, unquote. The 1969 case I mentioned earlier also addressed just briefly this very question of development. The local church which wanted to leave the general Presbyterian church also wanted to keep its buildings and property. And it accused the Presbyterian church of changing its doctrine and said they didn't have a right to the property because they had actually changed into a different church than the one the local church had joined. Significant to our discussion here, the court recognized that litigation could easily disrupt the process of developing religious beliefs and practices. Churches might claim to set practice not for the sake of religion, but for the sake of being on the right side of the law. The court said, if civil courts undertake to resolve controversies of belief and practice in order to adjudicate property disputes, the hazards are ever present of inhibiting the free development of religious doctrine and of implicating secular interests in matters of purely ecclesia ecclesiastical concern. It would be a chilling effect on the church developing its own understanding of doctrine. Attempting to explain to someone not familiar with the whole of the tradition why we do what we do invites extensive judicial intrusion into operations, doctrines, interpretations of doctrines, governance, and pastoral practice. Let me give you another example. Gradualism in sexual morality is undoubtedly part of the application of doctrines in particular instances, and it falls under pastoral practice. Gradualism is complicated because not everyone accepts it as a moral principle, and many do not understand it, and they confuse it with relativism. Yet it is part of the Catholic tradition. How would variable applications from instance to instance be considered by a civil judge or a jury? Sexual sin seems to, be the, seems to bother the Catholic Church the most. At least we are easily portrayed that way. But what if a straight teacher in a Catholic school regularly gambles his paycheck at the racetrack and impoverishes his wife and his children? If firing the gay teacher in a Catholic school upholds family values, then we would also fire the excessive gambler, shouldn't we? Would we want to turn that question over to a judge for her to examine whether a particular parish or diocese walks the talk? Another question to be raised is this. Would the practices of one parish or school dictate the practices of all parishes and schools? A myriad of questions and disputed opinions on church teaching, on subsidiarity and solidarity, and pastoral practice, as well as corporate law, would all likely be in play along with the original substantive question. Should these be examined by a civil court to see how we integrate our sexual moral teachings with all of our pastoral practices. Courts are reticent to enter into this fray, as well I think they should be, at least that's the official position of the Supreme Court. In the Hosanna Tabor case, the plaintiff argued that she was fired not for a religious reason, but because of her disability. Religion was merely a pretext. The concurring opinion by Justice Alito summarized the problem of a court, and sometimes a jury, determining if a doctrine or practice was central and universally known, or if it was an obscure and minor part of the institution's identity. He wrote, quote, the mere adjudication of such questions 
would pose, would pose grave problems for religious autonomy. It would require calling witnesses to testify about the importance and priority of the religious doctrine in question, with a civil fact finder sitting in ultimate judgment of what the accused church really believes and how important that belief is to the church's overall mission." Unquote. Professor Eldred has raised some significant questions for discussion, both within the church and among the professionals who represent the church in legal matters. I think it's well worth the discussion to consider how our legal defenses may impact public perception and even the church's own understanding of its teachings and practices. But I have some concerns, as I've said. One point I did not address was that of the ministerial exception defense and how this fits into the teaching of Vatican II on the role of laity. This also has its own complexity and is worth extensive discussion. All the baptized share in roles of priest, prophet, and king so as to impact the world to be salt and light. Would that make all the baptized ministers charged with promoting the teaching of the church? Yet, if they are all ministers, a Pew Research poll from 2015 shows that among U.S. Catholics, 76% think the church should allow artificial birth control, 62% favor allowing priests to marry, 59% think that women should be allowed to be priests, 62% think divorced and remarried Catholics should be able to receive communion, and 46% think the church should recognize the marriage of gay and lesbian couples. That last number rises to 58% among those who are 18 to 29 years of age. Perhaps even more concerning to that is that, depending on the issue, between 36% and 59% of practicing Catholics think that church teaching will change on these issues in the next 30 years. I think this raises serious questions for the prospects of the involvement of the laity as ministers of the faith on a broad scale. In conclusion, in winning the minds and hearts of the public, including the Catholic public, what Pope Francis said in Evangelium Gaudium is, per is pertinent. The message has to concentrate on the essentials, on what is most beautiful, most grand, most appealing, and at the same time most necessary. The message is simplified while losing none of its depth and truth, and thus becomes all the more forceful and convincing. Thank you. Thank you, Father Olson. So at this point, we're going to move into the panel discussion. And how this will work is that each of the speakers will have the opportunity to uh, uh, offer a question to one of, uh, one of the others. Uh, and then we'll move into the, uh, the open conversation uh, with the assembly. And I believe we have a, a couple of people uh, who have microphones. I see one there. Is there. Okay, another one over there. So how, th how that will work is if you indicate to the, uh, the microphone uh, holder uh, that you want to offer a question, uh, that'll be important that they'll be the ones who call on you, not us, because uh, it's a unique feature of this lovely auditorium that we can barely see you because of the stage lights. So anyway, wave to them, not to us. And, uh, We'll uh, get going from there. So, we also need a microphone. That's better. All right, so, um, Maybe the, the place to start is to uh, uh, offer Professor Alvarez the chance to uh, pose a question to uh, either Sister Kathleen or uh, Father Olson first to kind of kick us off if you want to start the conversation. Uh, could I ask one for you? 
Yes, yes, one to each. So, uh, for, for Sister, one of my biggest questions, I, I loved your presentation, and one of the things that I kept writing in the notes to myself was about the possibility for the time and the education in a parish community to do what you're suggesting to be done. I think people's greatest fear is not the other. It's the opportunity cost of making time for the other. And it's also the question of the amount of time a parish or a parish school spends on, I mean, just thinking about these beautiful values you put out about relationship, friends, commitment to one another, special care for those in difficult circumstances. Instead of memorizing the popes and, and spending all year getting ready for a sacrament, which is very important, but it, it, they're, they're missing the, the sixth grade or the seventh grade discussion about bullying and um, real friendships and not judging people on the basis of their money or their sports involvement. So I'm just thinking about this as someone who's just brought three children through parish schools. Um, the time and, and the, the willingness to have these kinds of conversations in educational settings. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Helen Albert. It is a challenge, uh, I, I admit. I worked in parishes, and at the same time, I know that there's a longing for that. And in the parishes where I worked, I particularly with the young adults, one of the things that they were looking for most was to have that experience of community, to have that experience to share the faith together, to be with people, young people who think like they think and have the same desires to love God and to know more about God. You can't do everything, you really can't. But I think some of those longings that people have for community because of the individualism in our society and the indifference that I spoke about is to find a place where they're welcomed and belong. And some parishes where I had been really don't have that. You walk in, you're strangers to others, you don't have pastoral ministry. It's hard to even find someone in the parish, a parish priest that will take the time with you. Other parishes I see do, do a much better job at that. And what I would like to see is just, not that you can do everything, but that people have the opportunity to get involved and feel that they belong in some way in the parish, to feel that it's a community, to feel that they know one another and have that opportunity to build relationships. And that, that's coming more from my lived experience being in the parish and um, what I would really see as a value that sometimes we're lacking. Thank you so much. I, I definitely took away from your pastoral advice the question of making the time and what it is that you have to give up. Yes. That you're really actually going to have to give something up in order to make this time for the other person. Um, so many thoughts in there. Thank you. And then to Father, thank you so much. And, and any of you who have presented papers know what a joy it is to have someone engage them at a high level and seriously while you're still in process to make it a better paper. So. Uh, I'm so grateful because, of course, my weakest area is the theological side, so this is terrific to have that engaging legal. Um, a couple of, let me try to put it together in, in one question. I, I was struck by the idea of development of doctrine and the sort of intellectual nimbleness needed for this when, as, as a contrast to your point about John Paul II's teaching being considered by some intellectualist and not really grappling with um, with, the, with the situations on the ground. I found those things bumping up against one another. And, it, and I wanted to say, you know, I would say that we actually are at these institutions, whether it's a Catholic hospital talking about life and death and having a baby and coming near death, and asking for sterilization, whatever they're grappling with, whether it's a Catholic school dealing with, um, with kids, uh, especially in emerging ages, they are in fact engaging in a description of what the church teaches not at a level above a sixth grader or an average American coming into a hospital. This is good. They are taking account sort of variations in special circumstances, which by the way, religious freedom allows you to do. It says it doesn't have to be that every church does the same thing. It just has to be a credible interpretation of your teaching. But I found that, um, I think maybe, I find that I think you're introducing too, too high an intellectual 
uh, requirement and too much uncertainty into areas where we're frankly actually dealing with it day in and day out at all these religious institutions at a level that does communicate to the average person, not at a high intellectual level, about things that are not highly uncertain um, in so many cases. There's lots of uncertainties, but you know whether it's uh, a good idea for a particular member of the staff to marry someone of the same sex is not one of them. Whether it's a good idea um, to have, we had an eighth grade teacher who had several children by several men and was asking the girls which hot picture she should put up online to meet her next friend. Um, whether that's a good idea wasn't a hard question. You know, we wanted to both find a place where she could have money to support the kids she had, but not be in front of the students as a role model. You know, so I guess I don't disagree with you intellectually with these things, but I find that the levels of sort of uncertainty and intellectual difficulty I'm not sure they actually exist on the ground in a lot of these institutions. That's okay. overall. Yeah. So, and I, I agree with that. So in many cases, the teaching of the church is well settled, and it's, it's not going to change on, on a number of things. I raise the, those issues because the church does develop over time. And if we put our teaching and, and, and stuff into a court pleading and say, this is where we're at, then does that stifle development? You know, because some things do develop over time, and practice certainly does develop over time. And so I, my question is, is that going to stifle the development? And I think that that's a real serious question for us. Does that put a chilling effect on it? And I think that's what um, um, Judge Alito mentioned in the, in the um, uh, Hosanna Table case, that this is, becomes a sort of chilling, chilling uh, effect upon, and he didn't use that term, but I did, a chilling effect upon the development of doctrine. It also recognizes, I think, that, that that it's a there was one school of thought that seems to think that that Catholic doctrine is just something pure and pristine and is up here like like Plato gave it to us, and the others say it really does develop as it as it works itself out in practice. And I'm going to be in that second school of thought a little bit more that it does work itself out in practice, and I think that that's you know. I like Thomas, and I think Thomas is one in, who's in, in, that, in that school of thought as well. And it works itself out. <laughs> it does work itself out that way. But also, you know, I also see that in, in, uh, in, in Pope Francis, and in, in Pope Francis, in that old quote that I gave, he's talking about the church working out particularly important issues as it grapples with variations. He cites Thomas for that. You know, and, and he makes the analogy to the fact that the one who has given us everything has created a tremendous variety of things. And it's for us to engage in that variety that helps us to see the complexity of all things that are given to us. So I, I think there's, there, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. Good. We'll turn then now to Sister Kathleen and uh, see if she has a, a question or issue she'd like to pose to Professor Alvary. One of my questions is we're looking at some ideals in the family situation, things that we hope for, things that we long for, things that we wish could be true in every family. But our reality today is that they're not. And we're dealing with a lot of families that have really suffered and are looking for healing. And how do we propose the things that you are talking about without stigmatizing other families. Yeah. Good, you have a ready answer. No. <laughs> no one ever has a ready answer to the million dollar question. It's like, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. You know? <laughs> 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 no, 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 it's a Monty Python joke meant for those who know the Paris joke. And so I, I, it was one of the qualifications for marrying my husband was, was this complete knowledge of the Monty Python catalog. So you know, that is a really tough question. Um, and there's a couple of things. So first is to say that we have to recognize that, you know, it actually wasn't always us. I, when, when I hear the word ideal, it always makes me a little nervous. It's true. It's both true. It's one of these nuanced things. And it, it worries me that we'll say, well, then it's obviously unattainable. That's the two sides of the, of the ideal coin. I agree that ideal is very rarely achieved on this side of heaven. Um, and But I do know that 
you know, we don't have perfect measurements. We don't know all the domestic violence that went on, although we do know it's less likely in marriage than out of it. We don't know how many people were in unhappy marriages they were desperate to get out of. We don't know how many of them were high conflict. We do know some things, however, that the vast majority of divorces have no high conflict, that most people who have a child out of wedlock would actually prefer to have someone else there to support them. We know that there were much, there were many, many, many fewer of these in the past. It was achievable, in fact, by our own country. Even by people who were very poor were achieving it at a very high rate. So we know that while this is ideal, in a sense, it is also a little bit, it's a bit more achievable than we think. Number one. Number two, I think we have to narrate exactly what we're doing. It's like when every once in a while when a priest is let me give a witness talk at Mass and, and you know, I want to narrate his terror um, and say something like, this is a very difficult topic and I know that many people here, for instance, in the Heinz Pass when I spoke about abortion in the past, people here have experience with abortion in their families. And that's why the church has Project Rachel, and I would, I'm so proud to be with the church in that. And I would say, and then I'd say, I'm also here to talk about the sanctity of life in a more general way. Like, to narrate exactly where we are on all these concerns so that people can actually hear us. So I would start by saying, you know that we want you to be here, and we love you and your family. We also know at the very same time that it would be terrific. For, for children, all children, if they had family stability, which seems to be a huge mediator of good things to children. And so we are walking the line of both um, completely being present for you and, and loving you who are here with all of your family difficulties. And believe me, I'm, you know, I, I'm totally there when it comes to, we, I have a very large family. We have one or two of everything. <laughs> I got 135 relatives just in Philly on the one side. Name anything I can ever describe, and it's us. And to say that, but to also say, but we know that we would like to do better by children. And, uh, and this is what we know. And this is not said for judgment. You know, we're not here, that is not our role or our prerogative. But uh, we do have a social justice role to make a better world for children. And we also have the knowledge that the way we've been going about it has not succeeded. And so we need to tell you that and tell you that we'd like to try this other word of wisdom about adult responsibility. I, I think you have to marry all of that. I can't, I, you can never just drop that one thing on people. I agree with that. So. Thank you. I actually have two questions, but one is one is just a lawyer question. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, do you think the Yoder case from Wisconsin would still be set, settled the same way that they did it um, back in 1972? So just to give you a little background to that, Wisconsin in 1972 required children to go through 10th grade of school up to age 16. And the, the old order, the Amish required them to go to up to 8th grade. 14 or 15 at max. 14 or 15 at max. And then the court said, because of that small difference between the two years of education that was required and, the, and what the Amish were actually doing, they didn't see that the, that the Amish were impinging upon the, the, what the state had as compelling right. Um, and one of the other things that was in, the, in, in, in it was the question of what you would ask the children and their position. And I wonder if you think that would be changing. That's a great question. So um, I was just teaching Wisconsin versus the other, both in my family law and in my law and religion seminar last week. Um, the Amish are a unique group. When Pentecostalist, Pentecostalist homeschooling families have tried to, to say, um, we're not going to meet the state standards for homeschooling. You know, I'm not certified. We're not using a state certified thing. But we'd like to keep our kids home. They would say, you don't seem to have a tradition of completely preparing the children for a separate life in society in your own microcosm where they are, you know, citizens who can function in a pluralistic democracy when they have to, plus um, um, uh, people who can support themselves. The Amish are very unique. And so the, on the one hand, I actually think maybe only the Amish. There's very few other communities. There's another community, some of you may know the wonderful Bruderhof in New York, and also maybe the Bruderhof. You know, there's some very few communities that can actually show this rearing of a child for a life 
in a community that remains a community where they are self-sufficient and the state doesn't have the concerns it has vis-a-vis -vis education, which is preparing a self-sufficient person. They're worried, they're, they're, they're worried about preparing a person who can live in a pluralistic democracy. Hmm. Many of these kids do stay. In fact, one of the highest predictions of them not staying in the Amish community is going to public school. Then they, they drop like stones. And the expert for the Amish community who said, we're going to lose the whole religion if you make us do this, was proved right even later. He was using some earlier stats, but the data since then has actually shown empirically that that tends to be what happens. So well, there might be some selection effects in that too, but it happens. But the question of how many Amish are leaving the community, if that was the case, and it, now ordinarily when a child comes to the court and says, I'm going to do something different than my parent and I'm still a minority age, the court says, frankly, your first interest is in being in the care and custody of your parents. So yours and your parents constitutionally overlap. So they haven't given the kids a lot of credence. Yoder did not answer the question, what would we do if the child had here a guardian ad litem or an ex-friend who was challenging the parents' rights to do that? And the fact is, if you don't go to high school, what might the court say? Has the child got, I don't know what Martha Nussbaum uses this expression or some others, the capacity for an open future, right? Um, well, some of it would be cut off. At the very least, they'd end up having to go to school much later or get a GED. So it's delayed, but it's not cut off. But even so, I think because of the fact of Amish leaving that community, it would be a little harder today for that, uh, for that case to be decided uh, in favor of the parents. A little harder, but because they're so unique, not completely. I think the, I, I, I think certainly the court would go back and ask the children more. That would be that would be the question that they would do. They would ask the children, "What would you What would you want?" And require that. Second question for you. When when pleading a case, one of the things that that that, that you want to do in, in your proposal seems to be to show that we have an integrated um, understanding of our faith. What happens when you do have one parish that decides a case, something one way? And next door, you've got a parish that decides it a different way. I, I think, for example, of the scandal of uh, you know the gay organist, which you know I don't want to pick on gay organists, but uh, it's, the, it's the common case. It is a common type of lawsuit. In one place, it would cause no scandal, and another place, it causes scandal. Where it causes scandal, the person is is dismissed. Where it doesn't cause scandal, they're not. And the court will look at that. How would we plead that? Yeah. Well, it turns out that's sort of already provided for in religious freedom law. So you've got the First Amendment, which is very hard to win under nowadays, because in 1990, Justice Scalia pulled back the degree of protection offered to religions um, in a thing called the Smith case. If a law is not after you on its face, and I'll give you, um, Father uses the, uh, one of the cases in the footnotes, Lakumi Babalu Hialeah Church. I got a lot of relatives still down there, by the way, Hialeah. In that place, they, they have this ordinance that says, um, you know, you can't kill animals including in ritual and sacrifice. But you can do kill animals in these other 92 ways, including greyhound racing. It's cool, right? And they say that it's an animal protection law. Well, so clearly that is a stop santeria law with the use of ritual and sacrifice in the law, with every bit of evidence about the, the Cuban city council in Miami like spitting at the microphone about we got to shut down these santeria folks. This law was aimed at religious folks, okay? So therefore, only a law that is that religiously aimed will generate the highest level of scrutiny from a court to protect your religious freedom. Otherwise, if the law is rational and tied to a legitimate state interest, you have to obey, unless the law is controlled by a strong state constitutional provision that protects religious freedom, a state religious freedom act, or a federal religious freedom act. And here's where we get precisely to Father's question. Both the state and federal, they're called RIFRAs, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, say it doesn't have to be something that is utterly required by your religion. You can take a position that simply you're, you can justify in your religion. And so they allow for a variety of, of so one parish could say, no, I've really got to fire this eighth grade teacher. I don't want her with any of the kids. And another could say, as we were, she's got some, she's got some kids. Um, let's put her in a place where she's not dealing with students, but she's rather a part of the administration that sort of just makes the place run. And um, that was our judgment. And um, 
you can do that, and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act will protect both of you. However, that's not going to be the case, maybe, if you're looking at a state or federal constitutional provision, or you know for sure that whoever is challenging you, the American Humanist Society, the ACLU, uh, on behalf of individual persons, is not going to point out this discrepancy. So, for instance, when Notre Dame, Notre Dame flipped and flopped and flipped, I think they had contraception sort of, and they didn't really know it in their insurance policy, then they removed it at a later point, then when they finally won the case, they said, oh, we're just going to provide it anyway. And um, they went back and forth and back. And when they had a case that said, we don't want to provide it, one of the big points on the other side is, but you used to. So how sincere are you really? Here, allowing for development of doctrine. And one of the things they've written into the federal regs, this, this uh, grandfather clause, so that we're not going to impose the contraceptive mandate on you, is only for people who had a religious position against it in the past for a certain amount of time. So they even caught them in the language of the reg. Um, that's a back and forth and back and forth, a yes and no. A more often, a more nuanced question of the relationship between this person's employment and the students at large or the, or the community. I think there'd be a lot of, of, of allowable room for variation on that in RIFRA in particular, in the RIFRA action, but you know that it would be used by those saying this isn't sincere or it's not religious. But because of court's willingness to step back from that, you're probably not going to get hammered on that. They're going to go, okay, that's your religious judgment and you have a valid reason for it. Good. At this point, I would invite uh, questions from the floor. So as, as you ask a question, please identify yourself and tell us who you are posing the question to. Father Martin Salinsky for Professor Albright. I was a little bit more uh, in some general things relying uh, with uh, First Amendment court cases. I'm so, sorry, pushing back on which cases? Uh, First Amendment. Okay. So I'm going to presume that there's going to be an increasing number of them uh, moving forward. Uh, just with Catholic lawyers, I mean, do uh, I don't know much about uh, the curriculum at uh, Catholic law schools. Are they kind of uh, focusing on that as part of their curriculum? Are there groups of Catholic lawyers in organizations that kind of take this as a point of study, preparing uh, for the future? That's a good question. There are lawyers at every, um, there are lawyers at religious universities and there are religious students at every university who are interested in this. It's become a cause celeb in recent years. And so there's more people who specifically come in to train up in this. Um, uh, I used to be at Catholic University of America, now I'm at George Mason. Uh, I taught this at Catholic U, we had centers. At George Mason, uh, and they presently have a guy, Mark Rienzi, who's just one of the best in this area, a very reasonable, very highly gifted Supreme Court level attorney who writes in this area, and I believe they got a small grant to have a center there on these, on these issues. We have a center on this issue at George Mason in Law and Liberty. Uh, I have, I'm giving a paper at one of their conferences on Friday. I did one last year. We call in all the best scholars in the country on this. It generates a tremendous amount of interest. There's also a law firm found by Seamus Hassan, the Catholic lawyer, who is a very gifted lawyer. I think he might have been a Notre Dame guy who founded a law firm now called Beckett Law that is considered worldwide one of the top firms on uh, non-establishment, free exercise. Uh, Beckett Law is what they're known by now. And they attract the absolute top of the heap lawyers. These aren't lawyers who came here because I couldn't get jobs in a regular firm. I think I'd like to do something for a good cause. These are guys who would be hired by any of the top firms in New York, Chicago, et cetera, who are doing this work. There's um, another group called Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, they are, uh, they do just religious liberty claims and they are everywhere. They're in India, they're in Geneva, they're in Brussels, they're, they're doing cases in Germany, in Paris. Um, uh, I, was at the, I was doing some work for the Permanent Observer Mission in Geneva not too long ago and, you know, Alliance Defending Freedom are highly knowledgeable and involved attorneys that they can turn to and get advice from as well. So it's really burgeoning. Alliance of Any Freedom gets something like, I don't know, thousands of applications and they pick 121 students every year and um, they, uh, I'm part of the, the group that trains them. We train them for two weeks 
and then they go out and work um for judges chambers, for members of congress, for international organizations, for the holy see, et cetera and um are highly skilled. and and they have their pick. they'll have they'll have seven kids from yale and four kids from chicago. i mean it's really stunning the the brains that want to go into this area now. so the good news is there's there's as usual plenty of lawyers. laughter i'm ah dr. debbie armenta and i'm an assistant professor of pastoral theology associate dean of formation and that i am the incoming director for the teaching parish program and i first want to thank you all um, for what you have done i know it's a tremendous amount of work and it's a privilege to be here to listen to you and i really just have a comment as a lay woman who's worked 35 years for this beloved holy mother church um east coast west coast down south and up here in chicago and uh, um, 33 years married and a mother of four children from 30 on down and i really want to just speak helen to your um what i find most compelling about what you have presented to us is the data and it's longitudinal data um i too am from a family one side of our family 135 first cousins we have two of everything <laughs> and and the reality is is that you know with all of the theory aside the data shows that the direction it's going in just doesn't work. And it's, it's protection of the dignity and sanctity of the individual. It's the protection of the dignity and sanctity of the child. Um, and all the, the I'm, I'm out in the parishes right now, 90 parishes in our teaching parish program in four dioceses. And I'm in there with the pastors, with the parishioners, um, and with the seminarians and talking and listening and you know we've got all this stuff up here and theory and polarization but the reality is is the movement of god in the trenches with the struggles the joys the sorrows the confusion the drugs the brokenness i mean that's and, and you present the data on how it's it's got a shift and father david to your very valid point because it's touched me personally in terms of you've got one parish over here doing this, you've got another parish over here doing that. As a pew sitter, as a mother of four sons, it's it's got profound implications. But again, I just I love the data because I think ultimately at the end of the day, that is what is going to, if anything's gonna wake us up, that's gonna be it. Hello, Professor Audrey. My name is Jane from the Diocese of uh, San Jose, uh, pre theology as well. And uh, I just want to thank you very much for your talk today, especially for us. We're going to be uh, future parish priests. We're going to be in the position of hiring people and firing people. So I think it's very useful for us uh, to learn um, uh, and do things to know about this. Uh, and also, uh, I uh, in your talk, you also mentioned about these uh, cases and these narrow pleading cases can can actually uh, swing the stomach of religious freedom. And I'm um, basically taking a step back and um, uh, for the integrated approach, I'll take a, a, a bigger picture. But I just want to ask you, um, for us, when uh, how do we strike a balance? between and because every case is just different and if you kind of like leave a case and it can cause a scandal and people think it's acceptable and then you know what happens to our uh, core our religious belief uh, i just want to see if you have any uh, suggestions for, for striking the balance uh, between them and perhaps have some kind of like a governing body we have like a we can ask the bishop to actually refer the case uh, to a, a governing body where they can take a look and so we have a unified approach. I um, just want to see what, what you think. Interesting. Yeah, um, a couple of things, and this is just a 
principle of legal and crisis management, you don't wait till the question comes up. It's like so many other things that have to be done in a parish. Something you, it's, it's so in the ether right now that you have to take up with your, with your parish, with your school, the question of, frankly, there's going to be a variety of neuralgic issues. I, you know, I specialize in the family. But what about questions about immigration and sanctuary in some parts of the country? Um, what about questions of the environment? What about questions of cooperation with, you know, let, let's say you've got a donor who's got a company that's really under scrutiny for not being, um, uh, for not being what they ought to be as a public citizen and so forth. So this, uh, just to say that these sex, marriage, and parenting questions aren't going to be the only one. They're the ones that get in the news, not by our choosing to select them out, but they do. So there, there needs to be a, uh, a, a discussion and a, and a plan for working this out in advance about how is this integrated into our life here in the school. And again, the diocesan attorneys I talked to say the schools are sort of like, oh, can we just stay away from the pelvic issues for five minutes, you know? And the answer is you gotta be prepared to talk about what you stand for and how it relates to other things. Is it, to, is it about justice for children? That's one possibility. Is it about the, the bigger things? And this is where it's, I, I really take Father's point on the difficulty of moving between John Paul II's description of things and how people's lives are lived. When I said I, I think that we're missing a widely available conversation about that, I was saying the same thing. But he used the language of it's, it's beautiful. It's true. It's, it's a brilliant scriptural uh, uh, unfolding. But how, for instance, um, on the question where, we've, where we don't have the agreement of the vast majority of young Catholics, same-sex marriage, let's say, do we understand the good of the female, the good of the male, the good of what they do together? And I'm talking not just about complementarity in the bedroom, I'm talking, or in raising children, I'm talking about complementarity in every place they work together. What's the good of having the two? What's the good of their union? What's the good of, what, why did God put procreation there? I mean, he could have put it with one or the other. We could have manufactured them. They could have grown in the field. Why did he put it there, right? What does that mean? What does it mean that the other will be wholly other and yet one with us? How does that inform our thinking about the immigrant, the homeless person we, uh, we, we feel we have no conversational entree with? The, the whoever, like how does our thinking about what goes on in the divergence of the male and female that comes together, that brings new life, that requires that you be both one and a mystery to one another, that requires faithful, permanent truth, what does that have to do with how we live with regard to the other? That this capacity for love through whatever, what does that have to do with other things? That actually has to be talked out. And it's not, we don't have it there yet. I am hunting like a crazy woman for this sort of stuff. And I find pieces. I find that there's a great uh, Jasani um, anecdote um, where he's a young priest, recently ordained, and he's riding his bike somewhere in uh, Milan. And he comes upon a couple in an in a alley kissing one another. And he, they jump apart when he drives by and he goes, if what you're doing is beautiful, why are you jumping apart here? And then he gets back on his bike and he goes and he comes back and he goes, wait, wait, you have to really understand what it is that you're doing here and its relationship to the stars and to every other moment of your life. I'm sure these people thought he was nuts, right? When they all left him in 68, they said something like, he's just an old guy who says the same thing again and again. I mean, they're just devastated. It. But he is trying to find a unity of teaching and that's what I'm hunting for in this. And that's what, there are writings here and there. There's a great piece on, on the church's teachings on, on, on same-sex unions uh, by a guy named Livio Molina who wrote uh, in the Comunio magazine um, that, that starts to get at some of the things. There's uh, Vladimir Solovyov, uh, who, who I know um, Benedict really loved uh, in his book, The Meaning of Love, who talks about what it means to learn to put another person at the very center of your universe. And you know, what does God mean when he says, love the other as I have loved you? He means that you're not the only gig going on at the center of the universe. How does marriage prepare you for that? How does parenting prepare you for that? You have to do these things in advance, is what I'm saying. So when the moment comes, you're not left with 
something simplistic and, and offensive to people. That the parish has an understanding and has, and, and that involves the, the time and the actual practice of having conversations across differences at the parish school, between the teachers and everything so people understand. There may be wounded feelings, there may be, uh, you hope not. You hope it's more a conveyance of something we're all on the path toward. But there's no substitute for the time and the education involved in getting on something of a similar page before the crisis hits. Yeah. Let, let, let me add just a little bit to that. I think, I think the question and what you, your response is, is very much what Pope Francis said in the Evangelii Gaudium. Look to what's most beautiful, most grand, and most appealing, and at the same time most necessary. And if you have your eye on those things, and you know, you're mostly seminarians here, if you have your eye on those things as you're progressing through your educational experience here, and not just turn it into a moment here and a moment there where you learn a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but don't see the whole picture, or where it fits in the picture, that's the problem. And, and I think we've got a lot of people who like to moralize about this issue or that issue, and it doesn't depend on just sexual morality, but moralizing about all kinds of things. But don't put it into the whole context of what's grand and beautiful, and then we lose, we lose what, we, what we need to do. To respond to your pr really specific question, what do you do as a pastor? You call your human resources department in the diocese. Uh, <laughs> only father could say that, not me. <laughs> Well, that went from Wyoming. Um, so I, this kind of goes into this discussion on, on what is the, the good, the true good. And if you're, so this is going to be like kind of a Law 101 question, but I didn't take Law 101. So my question is, in the eyes of the law, what it, is there an understanding of the true good for the human person? And if, if so, because like, if there's not, it seems like the discussion becomes very difficult when we're trying to argue cases because a lot of morality has to do with the telos, the proper end of the individual, and how do we get there? So if there's not, how do we how do we approach that discussion of this? no, this is what it means to be fully human. This is what it means to be for the true good of a human person. So could you speak to that? And Father might have a comment on this as well. On the one hand, the law claims to be um, not about morals. In fact, in Lawrence versus Texas, when the Supreme Court made sodomy a constitutional right, they said states have no right to legislate just because of good morals. That, that's out. That's, that's uh, irrational and, uh, and, and hateful, they said in the case of this law. So now you're left with health, safety, welfare. But don't fool yourself. Every law has an underlying moral position. So Nancy Pelosi, when she got up to pass the Affordable Care Act, said something like, this is St. Joseph's Day, and he would be very proud of me for introducing this law today and passing it because it's for the common good, and it's for families, and it's for vulnerable people, etc. You don't usually get it that explicit, but you do get a notion of right or wrong. We're making this law on speech because of this. We're taxing this extra and we're giving this a tax rate because we want to encourage this and discourage that. All law has some kind of anthropology, almost all. Maybe not, you know, I can think of some details of energy law, but even energy and environmental law, it's all got an anthropology you might think of. But they don't make it explicit, but it's there. Now, today what's happening is in the laws that we're dealing with, the contraceptive mandate was like, you know, the 11th commandment, you know, which my friends from Chicago say is break up into small groups and discuss, right? <laughs> but the actual 11th commandment, uh, in the view of the people who passed it, was, um, was you know, this mandate, it's, it's all good, it's all true, it's all beautiful, it's all for women, it's for freedom, it's for social equality, it's for the poor. Um, so they propose it that way, and it puts it in a moral place. Um, so just that's a comment on one part of it. The other part is, we don't actually have to prove that our view of the good and the right meets the state's view of the good and the right. All we have to say is it's a sincere religious teaching. However, they can overcome that if the state says, listen, you may have a sincere religious teaching, but we have a compelling state interest. So if your sincere religious teaching required, let's use the most extreme example we can think of, bride burning, okay? They would have a very easy time saying, sorry, no uh, sufficient free exercise because we have a, a more important state interest. There, as you can see, there isn't a need to come to a meeting of the minds on what is truly good or beautiful. As long as ours is sincerely religious and that the state's interest, which often has an anthropological or moral perspective, is or is not superior to that. 
that's all the law needs to handle. It doesn't want to get into, as Father said, the, 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 the legitimacy. So when the churches are fighting over property, what a shock. First, they were fighting over slavery. Then they were fighting over the ERA. Then they were fighting over abortion. Now they're fighting over same-sex marriage. These are the church property disputes we're mostly seeing. And the, the courts always say, listen, if there's a deed here that we can interpret in a neutral way, we'll do that. But in some cases, we're not go uh, they're, they're fighting over who's the truer church. We're not going there. We're not, we don't have, and may not have, as a point of establishment law, a view of what is the true religion or the true good. Do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, that's probably so. So uh, the way I took your, your question, Seth, is, is, is that it involves the question of what the state holds as a compelling interest and, and what that is. That is a moving target. As far as I, as far as I'm able to determine, and you know, I practiced law 20 years ago, but it was a moving target then, and it's still a moving target, and it becomes more and more difficult. I think as some of those things are things that we probably cannot um, compromise with and cannot agree with. I put in my uh, the, the longer version of of the uh, of the talk that I didn't do here was that one thing perhaps is that you might find that a compelling compelling interest is proper pronouns for people. And the state may hold that up as a compelling interest. I don't think we can compromise with that. I don't, I don't think we can, we, can, we can move on that. So we'll have to find some other way to work around that and say, well, we're not going to deal with that one particularly, but we still want to uphold human dignity. Uh, and that's going to be a difficult question for us. Hi, I'm Kevin Regis from the Archdiocese of Chicago. Uh, my question is for Professor Alvarez. Um, so, speaking of something that Father Olson brought up about the fact that most Catholics don't even follow church teaching on a number of things, um, what's to stop the courts from saying, uh, well, it's nice that you have this Christian anthropology that you says supports human flourishing, but you can't even get your own people on board, so sorry, but, you know, take your argument somewhere else. You know, what, what's the response to that? Is that, is that something that the courts can even do? I mean, Two things. There's a, it's, the, the answer to that is built into existing law, and it's also, um, there's a social pushback when um, the government says that. The Obama administration, they didn't take a lot of pushback on the contraception mandate, but when one of his spokespeople got up and said to the Catholic Church, you can't even, you don't even agree with most of your women. Your women don't agree with you. Um, it, it got a lot of, even Catholics who didn't, you know, who, who do not subscribe to Humani Vitae, et cetera, were like, that's none of your business. Your discussion of what's going on internal to the church um, should not be a factor in your governing us. Uh, but here's where the law actually comes in. Um, the law says that it's a teaching of the church on something that matters. You can prove that it is a teaching of your church. Um, so, for instance, nowadays you easily have people, it, you know, I, I don't know how this would come into play, maybe in non-discrimination law, divorce, remarried. I know the question is communion uh, that's taken up in Amara Satizia and in the fist fight that followed. <laughs> but um, the, if that came up in a legal context, the court might say, well, the person who is stating an interpretation of Catholic teaching that Bishop so-and-so and such and such a diocese said is a teaching, and this other person who is stating that this is a teaching is also a Catholic teaching. That, they're going to step down on that. Um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act says specifically, it doesn't have to be something that's a mandated activity to the church. It just has to be credibly a sincere religious teaching. So a variety of beliefs on that would still allow the church, et cetera, paradise, to win the case. The other thing that this brings up for me, a matter that Father had in his paper regarding, um, gee, you know, people disagree on these teachings, can we really all say they're ministers? Well, the very limited purpose for which I'm talking about, um, really not, not using the ministerial exception, but going past that, to church autonomy and having a community of folks who manifests who we are, uh, but even if we just limit it to the ministerial exception, which I didn't want to do, these aren't ministers for purposes of internal church affairs. It's if we had to be restricted to using the ministerial exception, and in the face of tremendous Catholic disagreement over a wide variety of issues, um, that disagreement wouldn't matter. It would be the religious institution, the teaching of the universal church, or the particular diocese, that would actually matter in saying this is, is, is where we stand. To the extent a parish hires or does not hire or fires people, 
who disagree on this or that question that's a that's a different personnel issue but to the extent that we could say it's a teaching of the church even though people disagree yeah we can thank you again professor Albury so I have another question this one's more like a particular example so you brought up the case today about the school or some kind of Catholic institution who had to rehire the food employee or something that was engaged in food service director what would it look like to try and argue with a positive church teaching in a law case in that in that in that circumstances how would you go about something like that the problem is there was no winning that case because they the church didn't have a status as a religious institution in Massachusetts because they hired and served non-catholics which is so they were not going to get that the other thing that happens in these cases is and you've seen this in many of the wedding vendor cases but it also swapped over into this case the church says listen we're not discriminating they were caught under the non-discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and they said no we got gay employees we have more than a few our problem is not his status his sexual orientation the problem is his conduct and he's public about it right he's got it up on his Facebook page he tells people about it he has a picture of his husband in the office and so forth so what's happened is and and of course the wedding supply cases in the vast majority of those cases those people have both hired and served gay people sometimes for decades in fact the very gay people whose weddings they would not celebrate or decorate for were people they had served for like 10 12 years as individuals and they'd made birthday party cakes and housewarming cakes what they wouldn't do is to celebrate the same-sex marriage itself so a couple of things one is it'd be nice to get it straight in courts regarding status versus conduct and it'd be nice to have broader non-discrimination laws in Massachusetts but as to what the church can do internally I mean you're really talking about working into anything you do on family life and here's where I said you know sex ed's got to become relationship education you're working into a conversation not only about sex marriage and parenting but all relationships which you think are related to that good friendship good friendship extended family families taking care of other families you're working into that the lessons we've learned from st. Paul's statement that marriage is this fascinating mystery that reflects the relationship between God and his people so what do we mean what is it about marriage it's the the joining across differences it's the procreation of children it's the 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 fact that it's sort of grace works of nature here evolutionarily parents are more inclined to their kids than they are to people who are not there and children it's learning it's it's having children be capacitated for what they are which happens best when their mother and father are both doing that to the maximum extent possible it's talking about the values that we take out of this and how it is that in a very sensitive manner then you have to contrast them with what they're being told you know we say you know we are teaching on contraception which I think you always acknowledge it's very difficult for people although I have much experience speaking about it to people who are Jewish or Muslim or otherwise who say listen I get your deal on abortion but not this one and and we will talk about how making a child together also has these huge impacts on the union of the couple and their ability to be stable and there for the one another for the children for the for the larger family and then we talk about how the world wants to introduce to you these other ideas and then we get most information comes out of distinction not description right and say it's problematic when children in the household are deliberately created not knowing their mom and dad you know that that we take care of tragedies when they happen we try not to manufacture them it's it's a really good thing for for children to be capacitated in their households this can't always happen but we try and insist making it happen that's why we have marriage prep that's why we have retrovi that's why we have ministry to the divorce etc so we both try and articulate we and it has to come down to like five six sentences when we do it in a pleading 
that this is a manifestation of our religious teaching about how we are to love one another as I have loved you, how we are to, to take care of people who are in our path as our neighbor, beginning with the people given to us who end up being after the spouse, the kids that are given to you, the other families that's given to you, the people who happen to live next to you, the people who are in your parish. And we actually have to phrase how this love in its unique properties relates to what the, the, the way we are called to love as Catholics and that, you know, we know, and to say that we do it in a positive manner, just again, to narrate our truth here, um, this has to be reduced in a manner that can be conveyed both to secular people and is true and is also compelling. I'm working on it, and I'm sure there are many lawyers doing the same. Uh, my name is Kevin Ripley from the Diocese of Green Bay. This question is for Professor Aldrich. Uh, regarding the extension to the public perception from the platform of the court. So, as you were just touching on um, consolidating the teaching to a five or six sentences, sure. Um, but the weak hand argument is very simple. And the, the weak hand argument in the court is pretty simple and I think spreads. I'm not saying it's the best argument, but I think it spreads to the public, uh, through news, media, or whatever. Now, the more positive expressions, how would that spread to the public, through the platform of the court? Is it gonna be through the media? Is it gonna be, I don't know, like, how would that work, is my question. That's a good question. The negative, the public already knows, so when they hear it again, it just reaffirms, oh, they don't do X. Um, there's, there's an enormous amount of press and coverage about these cases now. And they're quoting, oh my gosh, the quote from the parish priest in that IVF case, wait, I just, it's so painful. <laughs> what did he say? It, it got in the paper and it was just, <sighs> the pastor stated at his deposition, which was then quoted at court, she resorted to the practice of in vitro. She was culpable. She clearly knew that she, she did it knowingly and willingly, regardless of what the church taught. Oh, I, I just, that was all over the papers, right? The quotation of these things, it gets in the news stream. And the church can decide, if it's bold, which I hope it will be, that it wants to get in the news stream. It's going to answer the reporter's call, and it's going to be ready with a couple of those statements. It, it's, uh, it's in the New York Times, it's in the local press, it's in the local uh, news feed. They, they have pictures of people at trial, the church said. It gets out there. And then one of my, my prior nonprofits that I just closed because raising money is too hard on top of everything else is uh, it's called Women Speak for Themselves, where I basically had like 77,000 women on a, a, a Facebook and a mailing list, and I would send them the words to speak into the local environment. And then I brought 25 women a year together in Washington and trained them in social media, television, radio, speaking at your parish, at your kid's school, and writing. And in ways that were, um, and I had mostly Catholics, but I also had Muslim, Jewish, LDS, and some evangelicals in this group. Mostly Catholics, but I also had other women that I trained. Um, to do so lovingly, positively, intelligently, sometimes reference to the data, um, in a way, and, and they, we were getting out about, you know, an editorial a week out of these 77,000 women in the U.S. That's how you do it. So th this will need to be our final question because of the, prob the problem of air travel uh, in these uh, difficult days. Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll do my best to make it a good one then. Deacon Sean Smith from the Archdiocese of Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, Father Olson, I wanted to follow up on a point that you had made in your presentation regarding the concern about um, the chilling effect on the development of doctrine if, if teaching were to be enshrined, so to speak, in civil law. And I guess my my question is, if we're going to speak broadly of the, the flowing river 
a doctrine of teaching, how does that same idea then speak to individuals about their own ability and willingness to live out Catholic teaching? I mean, how does a person say, well, we're afraid to proclaim this and have it put in law because it might change? Well, similarly, I don't know that I'm willing to commit to it because it might change. I mean, the river flows both ways, so to speak. I mean, it seems, how do we balance that idea? How do we speak to people and say there's a difference between enshrining it in law, yet you should still, in pastoral practice, live out the teaching as it is in front of you, as it's presented today? Well, two things on that. First of all, my concern is that if you put it into a court case and the court says this is what the church teaching is on X, the church, through its bishops and its lawyers, tends to be fairly conservative. We want to hold on to the stuff that works. And so they're not going to want to push the issue, at least I think that's a possibility, they're not going to want to push the issue of actually developing doctrine and making it come about to something different over a period of time because you'll have this old precedent in the past that says if you do it this way, you're safe, and if you do it differently, you're not safe. So I think that's one issue. The second piece is that we've got a lot of Catholics who don't agree with us at the moment, and so I don't think they're held back by the idea of the church teaches this or the church teaches that. But also, development does occur over a period of time. It isn't just one moment, you know, you wake up one day and it's one way and you wake up the next day and it's something different. So that time frame is something that works in us. And it also works within the whole gamut of the Catholic faithful. We're all inspired by the Spirit. Ultimately, the magisterium determines the movement of that Spirit and where it has to end up, but we're all inspired by that. And so maybe some resistance to things which are taught in the church at the moment are a movement of greater understanding. I mean, that's a possibility. I'm not advocating heresy, don't get me wrong, but, you know, or dissent from church teaching. But I do think there's an appropriate thing to look at how our faith does, in fact, develop. And that's a bit mysterious within the Catholic Church because the Holy Spirit guides it. So it's not just very simple to analyze it at one moment. My greater concern is that if we take a look at court pleadings and we put it in the court and the court says, this works, that the church may say, yeah, that works, let's leave that one alone. That's a real possibility. Well, on behalf of Father John Carchi and the faculty, I want to once again thank Professor Helen Alvarez for serving as the 2019 Albert Cardinal Meyer Lecturer. I also want to thank her. We also want to thank our two respondents from the faculty, Sister Kathleen Mitchell and Father David Olson. As Father Carchi mentioned at the beginning of the lecture series last night, the Meyer Lectures seek to engage serious questions from the whole range of discipline, from theology to law, literature, social science, and the arts. Now, USML offers these public lectures as part of an institutional research agenda where we try to contribute to scholarship through the publication of these lectures as formal papers in Chicago Studies, which is the peer-reviewed open access journal of our faculty. Now, if you're not familiar with Chicago Studies, you can find the link for it 
at the bottom of the main USML web page. A nice thing about open access is subscriptions are free. And if you sign up for a subscription, the journal will come to you. Uh, so we invite you to join us, uh, not only here at the Meyer Lecture Series, but also to join us in the endeavor of Chicago Studies uh, as a part of our contribution to uh, intellectual formation. Uh, to all of our participants, both here in the Cardinal Mundelein Auditorium and those who have joined us through the live stream or online, see you next year.